So now I'd like to introduce James C. Watkins, who has worked with Clay for more than 40 years. His work is held in 23 permanent national and international collections. Watkins' work has been widely exhibited in 46 solo exhibitions and 170 group exhibitions. He was a Texas Tech University Horn Distinguished Professor Emeritus in recognition of national and international distinction for outstanding research or other creative scholarly achievements. And on the left, we have Paul Andrew Wandless. Paul is a sculptor and printmaker, um, and his work features ceramic processes, printmaking methods, and a wide variety of sculptural techniques and mediums. He uses clay printmaking, stone carving, mold making, leather working, metal smithing, wood carving, and painting in combination or individually for creative of his narrative works. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Paul and James. Thank you. All right, well, well, thanks for getting up early and going through security and all those lines to get here. Um, well, like James and I go back, you know, a long ways. And so I just wanted to talk about that for a second as we kind of, you know, go back and forth and, and doing our work. Um, I guess one quick question. How many of you are, anybody do any kind of printmaking in here? A few hands? Okay, good. Because the less of you that do printmaking, the more interesting what I'm doing will be. <laughs> um, so I am going to be moving around a lot. So I'm going to be doing one technique over here of doing mono printing on plaster bats. And then I'm going to be doing some screen printing. And I'll probably do that around here. And then I have some relief printing um, set up as well. Um, what, I will, what I will be doing first probably is working a little bit on the, on the plaster bats. Um, with the mono printing process, you put an image on a plaster bat, and then I'll start to paint this in with underglazes, and then I pour a casting slip on it. It rehydrates the image, and then that pulls it off. So, and I'll talk about all these again, obviously more as we're doing the processes. Um, but I will start to paint on this a little bit. I will be doing a little bit of um, relief carving so this is our linoleum, and if you've never carved with linoleum, it's a little bit stiffer to carve. So a nice thing to start with is, um, this is called Speedy Carve. It's just a soft, kind of um, like rubber-like material, almost like an eraser, but you know, a little, it's much more flexible. So I'll be transferring an image onto this and carving it, just so you can see me carve, because it goes a little bit quicker. And then I'll, again, I have some relief so I have a couple of presses over here too that I'll be using to print directly on clay with some, with some carvings I've, I've already done. So some things I'm not gonna carve to completion because they just take a little long. So I wanna show you a mix of how do you make screens and put images into screens, how do you make the blocks, and then I have things already done where I can just actually print with them. So it kind of be moving. So if you do have questions as I'm working, just say something and then I'll stop and, and go back over, over something. Um, what I wanted to you know, say about James, so James and I, when I was an undergraduate at University of Delaware, um, I all right, you <laughs> did. So I, w I was there in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and Victor Spinsky uh, was my professor there. And um, so one year, um, you know, because Victor, you know, has lots of friends. Uh, those of you familiar with Victor Spinsky, he has lots of friends. They would always come by. And when they would come to visit Victor, lots of times they would come into the studio and, and demonstrate. So, um, you know, just during class. So one year, we were trying to figure this out, James, right? It was, I think it was like maybe the early 90s. Um, James came through. So again, I, I was a student as an undergrad, and James came through. And then, of course, he was, you know, throwing these uh, large platters with the double-walled um, rims and just these double-walled vessels. And, you know, we were just all <laughs> shocked, right? No one, of course, no one was doing it. And then I'm 
probably the same height I was then. And so James, you know, just coming up to James, I'm, I'm talking up you know, all the time. So it was just, it was just a, an incredible experience when he was there. And then when James left, uh, we were all trying to throw double-walled vessels, <laughs> trying to throw great, great big platters. And, um, and we weren't doing very well at it, right? It didn't look as easy as, as, as it looked like when James was just throwing these very large forms, like with ease. And Victor was like, um, he's like, well, the reason that James's pots are so big is because James is big. He said, have you seen his hands? He goes, his pots are proportional to him. <laughs> he goes, so you're not going to be able to throw that big with that much ease. And, you know, you have to kind of find your own, find your own groove with things when you're first starting out and then, and then make them bigger. Um, but that was an important visit, too, because at University of Delaware, um, you know, like many find ourselves, I mean, I was the only African-American, you know, black student in, in almost the whole art department, let alone clay. So for James to come through, for me to see someone who was successful, looked like me, doing something that I was hoping to get into, um, you know, that's just very inspiring to me. It, it let me know that there, there was a path for me, and that path could lead to success because James was there as an example of, you know, because he's, you know, teaching at Texas Tech already and already had accomplished quite a bit. So for me, it was an example of, okay, I, I can maybe do this. So, so I just always, you know, wanted to say that. And then we've been, you know, friends for a long time now. And because um, we've had some, you know, our lives have overlapped quite a bit with projects that we've done and things. But he's always been a, a good friend and, a, you, know, you know, started as a good mentor and then became a good friend. And, um, so it was real, like it was very cool to be asked to do this, but then when I knew James was going to be doing it, then that kind of made it special uh, for me. So, so I just want to say, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be fun to be up here working with James and um, not just have, you know, anyone who knows me knows I can talk three hours without doing anything. So I'll go ahead and, I'll go ahead and stop now and well, let James go. <laughs> uh, tell them about the book deal. <laughs> so... So some people, you know, might, so James and I wrote a book, I guess it was in 2014-ish, it came out, Alternative Kilns and Firing Techniques, and I was on the board of directors then for Inseca, and Suzanne uh, Torley, she was the editor at the time for Lark Books. So back then with Inseca Connections, you know, people would say, this is an idea for a breakout session, so, so her idea was how do you pitch an idea for Lark? Um, sometimes they have an idea and then they write the book, and sometimes they have artists in mind to write a book. Um, so in this case, they wanted, um, so she was telling me about her program, and she goes, oh, by the way, do you, do you happen to know James Watkins? So I was like, I do, actually. And um, she's like, well, we want to have a book on alternative firing. Um, we haven't been able to reach him. If you can get a hold of him, let, let him know we're interested in him writing a book, then, you know, we can, can you get us together? I was like, yeah, no problem. So, so I called up James. This, you know, this is before cell phones, email, that kind of thing. So I called James up. And I explained, so, you know, they want you to write about, you know, Raku and Sagger and pit firing, and et cetera. And James was like, well, I think he had just got done writing a book, right? Mm -hmm. So he just finished writing a book already. Um, and I believe it was architectural drawing. Yes. So it was an architectural drawing book. And, um, and he just didn't want to go through the experience of writing a whole another book again. So James is like, I know you do alternative firing, like more of the, like the pit fire and some of the wreck. He goes, I'll tell you what. He goes, tell them if you write the book with me as co-authors, then I'll say yes. I was like, well, that wasn't the question. <laughs> they wanted you to do that. I mean, I'm just out of grad school a couple years, my first teaching job. Um, so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll tell them, knowing that they were going to say no, but at least I tried, right? So I called Suzanne back up and I said, well, you know, James says he's interested, but only if I co-author with him. So that way, you know, you know, he'll write certain sections and then I'll write, write some others and then he, he would do it. And she said, well, if it's okay with him, it's okay with us. So <laughs> that's how I got into writing how-to books and stuff. So, so I thought that, so, because I took writing in college because I did want to write, but sometimes it really is about, you know, right place, right time, being prepared for the opportunity. And then, uh, or sometimes, as James had, like throwing you to the fire opportunity. Um, but that, that was a great experience, and that led to other experiences, writing the book and, and things like that. But so, yeah, we, we have, um, we have a, a great shared history. And I think that's what's great about Clay, is a lot, I'm sure a lot of us have these kind of stories of you know, people that we've met and things that we've done together. And, um, and I'm sure over the next couple hours, we'll reminisce about, about more things as well. Great. Thanks, Paul. So, yeah, this has been quite a 
an adventure. Uh, so what I'm doing is uh, I did some prep work yesterday. I'm going to work on two pieces today at the same time. This is going to be a double wall vessel and it'll probably be a double wall basket. And this is going to be a large, um, I call them anthropomorphic forms. It's going to be similar to the form that's at the uh, Weston Gallery, if you all haven't seen it. it, it and it's similar to the, the form that's on the, the uh, poster of Nsika. It's reminiscent, reminiscent of my uh, grandmother. It's, a, it's based on the form of my grandmother. It's like a voluminous, voluptuous form. And uh, when I'm in my studio at home, I work on three wheels so that there's always something going on at the same time. But at a workshop, I have to work quickly, so I use a, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. It's just a yeah. I use, uh, I work on three wheels so that there's always something that I can do. I don't have to wait a long time, but I don't force dry. I use a, uh, a heat gun here to make it happen quickly. So I throw the foot on the piece and then I poke a hole through the foot with a tool to allow air to escape. But I want to tell a story of how I got interested in clay and art. Um, I give credit to my mother and my grandmother for my interest in art. Um, my f earliest memory is looking at a portrait of my great-great-grandmother that was at my grandmother's house. It was hanging on the wall and my grandmother would give me old calendars and I would lay on the floor and draw them. Then when I went to elementary school, we did our lessons on Big Chief tablets. And I would fill up a Big Chief tablet every week with drawings of boots, cowboy hats, and rifles. And my mother would scold me for having to buy a new Big Chief tablet every week. And one day my grandmother was there and she observed my mother scolding me. And she said, don't fuss at him. One day he's gonna be an artist. She said, I'll buy his Big Chief tablets. So she would buy me a case of Big Chief tablets and I felt empowered. And from that moment on, I knew I was gonna be an artist. And I never wanted to be anything else. And my mother started encouraging me, and she would collect magazines that had the Draw Me advertisements in them. Anybody remember those? Yeah. So I would do the drawings, and she would critique my work. She didn't know anything about art, but she would tell me that the eyes were too close together, or the, you know, the nose needed to be done more uh, correctly, and I would go back and do it again. And then one day, I came home from school, and there was a Caucasian man in the living room with a briefcase and a portfolio. I didn't know what a portfolio was. I was 15, and they were all looking at me very strangely. And I thought I'd been caught doing something naughty. So, <clears throat> and he was there to take me away. <laughs> but, he had drawings that my mother had sent to the contest, and I was allowed to take a correspondence course. But what that meant was that my father, who was a farmer, 
had to pay $20 a month for me to take the course. And I have uh, five brothers and sisters, there's six of us. So that was a, a big commitment, but he did it. And so I took that as a, an act of loving support. And then when I graduated from high school, I had a portfolio and I went to a community college because we couldn't afford to go to a regular college. And when I took classes, I took 2D classes mainly, drawing and ceramics and, you know, the, the normal college prep courses on, you know, academic courses. And <clears throat> there was a ceramic course that was occurring on the opposite side of one of my 2D classes. And I went in one day and all the students were working on the wheel and they were helping each other and mixing clay and firing the kiln and they were cleaning brick that they had salvaged. They were gonna build a new kiln. They were helping each other. And coming from a farming family, I was uh, attracted to the co communal activity because that's what we did in the farming community. And I asked uh, one of the students if I could make something. And he said, go away, you're bothering me. So I knew that I could make him mad. So I said, well, you know, anybody can do that. I said, I bet you a dollar I can make a pot. So I got on the wheel and I made this short, dumpy, ugly little pot. But I was, a, I was hooked from that moment on. So I kept going to, over and cutting my class and I made pots and finally my instructor, he said, are you in my class or in the clay class? So I had to make a decision. And I dropped his class and I took clay. And then uh, I was so enthralled with making pots that I would come to the studio at night and make pots and uh, crawl through the window, you know, to get into the studio. And my instructor, he said that he would come at night to make pots and he would see me and he would go home. And then he finally came to me and he said, James, I know what you're doing. I'm going to give you a key and make you my assistant so you don't get in trouble. And then when it was time for spring break, he said, I want you to come to Kansas City with me. He had graduated from the Kansas City Art Institute, and he was a hippie. His name's Paul Molesky. He taught at Onondaga College in, uh, in Syracuse for many, many years. He just recently retired. And he said, uh, I want you to go to Kansas City with me, meet Ken Ferguson. I didn't know who Ken Ferguson was. I was 18, and I said, well, you know, I have to ask my mother and father if I could go. He was a hippie, he had long hair, and he wore, wore uh, bell bottoms that he split on the side and had uh, bell bottoms uh, with uh, flowers on the side, and he always wore uh, clay on his jeans, like a bad, badge of honor. And I thought, well, as soon as my, and he, he had a 1969 VW bus, so he was classic, you know. So I said, as soon as my mother and father meet him, they're not going to let me go, you know. But I invited them over, and my mother had made a big uh, bowl of popcorn for the, my five siblings. He laid on, got on the floor and ate popcorn with my brothers and sisters and told them all about the Art Institute. And uh, they thought he was a nice guy, and they let me go. And so I met Ken Ferguson, and that's how I got interested in becoming a teacher and why I'm here. So what I just did was, thank you. I took this little tool and I measured so that I would get equal spacing for my feet. And then I poked this hole through and now I'm gonna clean it up and turn it over and start adding a coil to it. 
Okay, Paul. <laughs> My turn. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so what I'm doing now is, or I guess what I, what I already, already have done is I wanted to transfer an image. And I've never, I've never thought of myself as someone who draws especially well, right? Um, but over a period of time, I kind of found a style that I felt comfortable drawing. And then it finally became to the point where um, I felt okay showing people my drawings. <laughs> so, because I think that's one of the biggest things. I, when I was young, um, you know, I went to a small school. I grew up in Smyrna, Delaware, which is back then it was maybe... I don't know, 2,000 people lived in the town. It was mostly a farming town, Delaware back then, especially lower Delaware. It was mostly, you know, fairly rural and, and a lot of farming going on. So our high school, when I went, uh, mostly, and this was, you know, in the early 80s when I was in high school, um, most people sometimes went to college, but maybe to get like an agricultural degree, you know, and come back and, and work on a farm. Or a lot of my friends, um, you know, joined the military. I mean, that's, you know, when, when recruiting happened, like, you know, in the lunchroom. And, um, and then some would just maybe just work locally. So, so I always loved art, and my mom always encouraged it. Um, but it wasn't anything I saw that I was going to actually do. Um, but I like to paint, and I like to draw, because that's what we had in, in high school. And then eventually, you know, I decided I wanted to, to go to college. So, so when I went to college, um, I was a little bit older in life. You know, I was in maybe my, I don't know, like maybe early 20s. Because I did what everyone else does, is right after school, um, you know, I went and I was like, well, what will I do? I was like, criminal justice. So I went for criminal justice because then I thought I could maybe be a state police officer or something. I went for a semester, went about halfway through the semester and I decided I didn't want to do that and I didn't want to go to college at all. So I just stopped going to classes, right? Classic, because <laughs> I didn't think I was going to ever go again. Um, so of course that you know, ruined my GPA. But, um, but over the next couple of years, um, you know, of course my, my parents had died. I was adopted when I was young, so they were older when I was adopted. So they were in their 60s when I was adopted, and then a, a year later um, my brother was adopted. Um, but because they passed away and I was just maybe like 19 when it happened, um, it kind of showed me how short life was. And I said, I do want to go to college, but if I do go and I have to pay for it myself, um, I want to go for something I want to do. So I said, well, I'm going to just take art classes. So I still lived in Smyrna, um, which is about 45 minutes south of Newark, Delaware, where um, University of Delaware was. So I got a job and then I would, I still worked full time and I would just drive back and forth and commute because it was too expensive to live on campus. So, so that's why I went part time. Um, and then my first semester, um, like most, you know, I had to take 2D design, right? So I'm taking 2D design because I, I was going to be a painter. So we had our first critique and we all put our work up and I'm looking around and then I realized that my mom had been lying to me. <laughs> she told me what a great artist I was and how fantastic my paintings were. And I was like, okay, you know, and then of our first critique, I was like, wow, that's not, no. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to have to really work hard to make my dream of, you know, being a painter come alive here. So, so the next semester, we had to take uh, 3D classes. So I, so I took 3D design and, and I took ceramics because I figured I'd take those two classes and, uh, and get them out of the way. Um, and that's how, how I met Victor. But in terms of my drawing story, um, you know, I was very, so very self-conscious about my drawing, about showing it because, and then I had a professor once who told me that, if you can't draw exactly what's in front of you, that doesn't mean you can't draw. It just means you're not an illustrator. That's all. He goes, everyone can draw. He goes, what you have to do is understand the fundamentals of drawing so that way you execute however you draw as best as you can. And then that's just what your style of drawing is. What, the way that you draw being different from others is what makes it unique. So, you know, instead of you know, being, I guess, self-conscious about how you draw. He was just like, embrace how you draw because that, that's who you are. So it took a long time for me to actually take that to heart. You're like, yeah, okay, sure. Um, being nice. Um, but, but it is true. So it took me, it took me a while to figure that out. Um, but I still didn't figure that out in undergrad school. 
Um, the reason I got into clay, and you say I'm going, my stories don't, they're not linear. Um, so when I took clay, uh, you know, Victor was my professor and uh, Victor Spinsky. So at the end of the semester, because you know, I was just all ready to you know, jump into like painting one and drawing one after that semester. Uh, but Victor, um, at the end, he said, hey, um, are you going to sign up for, for ceramics too? I was like, I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. Because um, I picked up the wheel really fast. Because um, I, I worked construction, you know, when I was in high school, things like that. And like sculpturally, you know, I already knew how to use tools. It's just a different application of tools to work sculpturally. So he's like, no, I think, I think um, he goes, you, you should take ceramics too. Um, now, he was the first professor to ask me back. <laughs> so, because typically, you know, I had a 2D professor who was like, enjoyed having you in class, you know, good luck in whatever you decide to do. <laughs> so, I, I didn't take the hint, <laughs> but, uh, so Victor was the first one to say, hey, come on back. And, you know, my sculpture prof professor, Joe Moss, was like, you're taking another class. So, I was like, I'm going to go over here where, you know, they told me to come back. Um, and now Victor, if you're not familiar with Victor, you know, a lot of what I do with screening and things that, you know, he made, um, you know, he was one of the people who led the Trump Loy movement in ceramics. And um, so when I was introduced to ceramics, he had a room that he did four color separation to make his ceramic decals. Um, so I just thought that was normal to do screen printing as part of your process. And then, of course, he was a master mold maker because he made all of his molds to cast his work. So I just thought that was normal. Um, you know, he did alternative fine. So, you know, he did everything. So I just thought that was normal. And the way that Victor taught, um, he didn't want anybody just to know one thing. He said, you know, as you go through the curriculum, you should know all of these things so that way you can decide what you want to do. He goes, what you're doing in school now may not be what you do three years from now. So if you don't learn these other skills, then you don't, you're not going to know where, where to take, take your work potentially. So, so I learned a lot from Victor um, as well about just trying to broaden the different things. So, so relief is one of the things I like the best. It's, it's a kind of a physical activity. You know, I like the tactile uh, nature of it. And I was talking about the, uh, the lino cuts. Um, has anyone carved linoleum before? A few? Okay. Not fun, right, sometimes? So linoleum, it's a little bit stiff. It's a stiff substrate. Um, you can take a heat gun and kind of warm it up a little bit to make a carb, but the best way to carb linoleum is to just buy better gouges, right? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the trick. Um, I'll do a little bit of carving um, in a minute, but so, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with these, uh, with these speedball gouges, right? These are the common gouges that we all get, and these work really fine, um, but you also sometimes need, these are uh, flex cut. Um, if any of you, anybody do any wood carving or familiar with wood tools? Okay, good. So with wood carving, like flex cut is, um, they make a lot of different knives and gouges. So, so this is flex cut, but they do make a, a wood cut. Uh, these are, they just call them wood gouges, but they, you can use these for um, carving wood blocks. But these are um, things that you can sharpen, you know, you can kind of wet sand them. So these are very, very sharp. So these cut through linoleum like butter. So, so sometimes it's just, and this isn't super expensive, maybe like 65 bucks and it comes with a nice kit and a handful of blades and you can get even more. Uh, but they, they're similar to speedball where you do have the one handle that you can put these in. So, but the tips, the gouge tips are a little bit different. So that's why I use both. I mean, they, they both have a good use. Um, but if you do get into linoleum, I would say, you know, certainly start with the speedball ones because they're less expensive and they work really well. But if you're carving something big and you, and you have a lot of work to do, then like anything, first test with something that's more of a modest cost. And if it's something you're really interested, then go ahead and invest in the tool that, you know, the tool that you only have to buy once, you know, after that. So with that being said, this, um, I have a lot of speedball stuff because I'm doing a lot of printmaking and they, and they kind of specialize in a lot of like relief and screening and that's, you know, that's my backyard. So this, this is called Speedy Carve and um, so this is nice and soft and this carves like butter. So if you've never carved before and you just want to learn how to carve, then this is really good to start with. Just use the regular gouges because that way you get used to the tools. And then once you get used to the tools, when you start carving on linoleum, then you're just getting used to the material, right? Because you already know what the tools will do and the kind of marks that they'll make. So, so with this process, and I, 
I don't know, were, were, you, were you able to see how I transferred this? So the nice thing about this is that um, you don't need to draw directly on there. If you just draw on a piece of um, tracing paper, and then you just take the tracing paper on the side that you drew, and this was an HB, so it's not even a very dark pencil. Don't do too dark of a pencil, like an HB or a B or even a 2B. Once you get to 3B and darker, then it just smears a lot. So, so HB or 2B, make whatever drawing you want that you want to carve, and then put it face down and you just simply rub the back. And then that just rubs the graphite you know, onto the surface. So it's a really nice way to transfer the image. Um, and it gives you plenty of time to work and rework your drawing in terms of getting it right. Now, when you do relief print, though, this is just like a stamp, right? So the way that it looks now, when you print it, it reverses the image. So the other nice thing about you know, working on, on tracing paper is that you can go ahead and draw this, um, the orientation that you need it to be. So then that way, when you rub it on there, you know when you print it, it's going to be facing the side that you want. I never care, right? I just, um, I, I always like, if I draw a profile, it's typically going to be looking this direction. That, that's just what I do. Trying to draw it the other way and then trace it and then flip it, that's just too much work. So, and I like how the process changes my image. I don't want to have full control over what I'm doing. So I, I enjoy how everything translates. So I just draw how I draw naturally, because as I mentioned before, if I try to draw unnaturally, <laughs> it's not going to work out that well. So I draw as best as I can, and then, and then I just appropriate myself over and over and over. So, um, so I'll make an image, I'll trace it, but then I'll carve this a lot. So I have a couple different versions of this where you know, the, the face is a little bit closer to the edge, but then I wanted to have, you know, more hair going back. So um, since I have my image, I can just redraw it again. And then, um, then I wanted to take it and then maybe have it where it's, you know, one's coming out of the other a little bit. It takes me about a year before, like, when I work on images, they're more like characters, you know, because it's like storytelling, narrative, and I have this whole thing in my mind about what I'm doing. But it takes me a while to get to know these folks, right, who I'm working with. And that's where I do a lot of writing as well, because sometimes I'll do some writing, I'll write a short story or a narrative, and then these are some of the characters that come out of it, but they're kind of like metaphors for people. Sometimes it's me, sometimes it's, you know, friends, sometimes it's a compilation of things, but they all have meaning to me, because the more that it means to me, then the more nuanced and detailed I can be with what I'm doing. I'm not just making something up, so that's why, and that's just how I need to work as a, as a storyteller. Um, but it's all metaphor f for bigger things, um, but I do have to have it rooted uh, for me. So, so sometimes I'll need to make this into a screen, uh, make it into a print, um, so I can do it with Lino, and do it over and over until I finally figure out, well, this is how I want to use this image. Um, rarely do I draw something, carve it, and then it becomes a piece right away. Uh, normally it, it takes a while, and it kind of gets worked, in, worked into things. Um, so, it's a, so it's a slow process creatively in a sense of when I'm developing new images. Um, but for me, it's always discovery and doing that. So, so that's what these three things are. I did a quick carve last night just to see. I don't carve super fast and I, it can be a bit like grass growing. So I wanted to see how fast I could carve this last night in the hotel. So, uh, so it didn't take me too long. It's just a quick initial carve. And again, this is going to be kind of like a cooking show kind of a thing where I can show you the different stages where hopefully it, it makes some sense. So, and as I'm talking about things, if I start on a topic and I end up on a topic that's way out there, I might need to be reminded where I started to get back to, to answer what you actually asked me. <laughs> so, um, so what I'll be doing now is um, I'll probably proof this to see how it looks. And then I will go ahead and, since I've talked about these tools, um, I'll start to like slowly carve, like just one half of this, just so you can kind of see the process and, and see some of the tools that I'm using. And I'll also carve on this one a little bit too. So I'm not gonna take either to completion, but I'll do a little bit of carving, you know, just so you can see that process. Um, the other thing I'm gonna do is um, finish I'm just doing a little bit of drawing on here. I already screened an image on here, um, so that way I can draw the background in. 
so for mono printing, this is a plaster bat and you have, you know, you weigh the plaster in the water and you cast it because this is mold making. So when you put casting slip on here, the plaster is going to uh, wick the water out of it. So that's why it needs to be, um, you need to weigh it out. She weigh it out anyway, right? So that's something from Victor, you know, working with Victor, you owe, he goes, it, it take five extra minutes to weigh it out and then your molds will last for a decade. If you skip that, it'll last for like months. So he's, uh, he's very, he's very, uh, he, he's very technical. So that, that's where I, I kind of get that from. So with this, um, you kind of work from foreground to background. So what I like to do with monoprinting, monoprinting is the process. What you end up with is a monoprint or a monotype. So, you know, printmaking terms. Because if you don't know the difference, if you exhibit it and you call a monotype a monoprint, then a printmaker is going to think you don't know what you're talking about. So just like, like with us, if someone looks at something and they say, oh, that's really nice stoneware, and we're like, that's porcelain. <laughs> so it's the same thing, right? So we need to know, if we're working in another medium, then we, know, we need to know that lexicon as well. So we're appropriately referencing uh, what we're doing. So this goes from um, foreground to background, and I use underglazes to do this. Now, the nice thing about this come up is that um, I'm not on the clay clock for this. I can work on this for a year. Until I pour it with um, casting slip, you know, it's, it's perfectly fine. So once I have an image on here, and I printed this image on here with a screen, and I'll, I'll, I can maybe print it again later, then I start to draw in the rest. And once I draw in the rest, I'm just gonna use a brush, and then I'm just gonna brush over my lines, and then I'll go ahead and use color to, to color in the piece. Mm -hmm. Then once it's colored it's, in, it's I'm gonna put a clay dam around the perimeter, and then I'll pour a casting clay slip clay. on top, and then that'll set up overnight, and then I'll be able to pull it tomorrow. Yeah. I have some smaller plaster bats as well that I'm going to um, screen directly onto. So the, since these are smaller, because um, three hours goes back by super fast. So um, this is smaller, so I can screen on here, and then I can pour this, and this will set up a little bit quicker. I could potentially maybe you know, do it by the end. But, but the, the size of the bat just dictates how large your, your piece is. So with these plaster bats, you know, you can make them... Um, any size you want. So, Paul, I'm at a stage where I need to tell them a couple of things. Yeah, because I, I was just finishing up too, so that's perfect timing. Um, okay, what I've done is uh, I poked holes through the, the feet so that the air can escape through the double wall form so that they don't blow up. And uh, now I'm ready to add a coil to the inside rim and then I'm gonna add a coil to the outside rim. So what I do when I'm making the double wall forms, I have two walls coming up at the same time. So I add a, a wall, a, a coil, and I just keep building it up until I get the shape that I want. And um, I started making the double wall forms because uh, I grew up in a farming family and uh, my Mother and grandmother, they made hominy and sauce, which is also called hoghead cheese, but in Alabama they called it sauce. Anybody familiar with that, that term? Yeah, it's really good, but it's fattening. <laughs> but I love it. And thankfully, they don't make it in, in Texas. They don't sell it, so I don't eat it. But, uh, and they also made uh, something called chicharrones. That's what they call it in, in uh, Spanish. So my job as a kid was to keep the fire burning hot around the pot. And that was a big challenge. And I was very proud to be able to, to keep the fire burning. And they washed clothes in the cast iron pots and once a year, they would boil all of the beddings to get the mice out. And so when I started making pots, I wanted to make these big pots, big bowls. But they would warp in the kiln uh, because I wanted them on tripod feet or feet of four. And um, I tried making them real thick at the rim and I tried making them upside down 
but that nothing would work. And one night I had a, a lucid dream. I dreamt that I was in Santa Fe and I came to a gallery that had big pots and they were real thick looking. Hi, Vince City, I see you back there. Uh, and so uh, it was as if I didn't get the message and I bumped into the window and I reached out and I touched the pot and saw that it was double wall and I realized that the inside wall would give it structure and keep it from warping. So I started making the double wall pots and then very quickly the rim became a, an element that I could make it more sculptural, make forms on top of it, make it more lyrical and tell stories. So that's where that came from. Okay, so now I'm gonna roll out a coil and put that on the top. So I need to... And I could do this using an extruder, but I like the physicalness of rolling the coil out. We have to be very careful up here because it's covered with plastic and it's very slippery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Paul. I have to talk again? Yep. <laughs> I'm hard to stop. You gotta cut me <laughs> <up>. <laughs> um, All right, so what I'm doing now is um, if you have there's, some. There's a couple, di the other thing about, you know, what I was talking about drawing, um, carving's the same way. Um, some of you who, you know, some of you raise your hands that you have done a little bit of carving. So you can see this is going pretty easy. Um, you don't want to have your hand in front of you because um, it can skip and it, you can stab yourself. Um, typically the two most common injuries in, in art departments are exacto knives and and gouges, right? Um, not, not the big stuff. So you want, kinda wanna keep your hand, you know, always to the side as you're carving. Now, there's different kinds of tips on these, and um, I think you can see the table. So there's, you know, V's, and then there's what are called uh, sweeps. So, can you see that? Okay, cool. Um, so these are uh, a variety of V's and sweeps. Now there is one that looks like a channel, like this, but you don't want to use those. Um, one of the things, because I will actually start you know, doing stuff with clay here, um, but one of the things that you can do with these is emboss them. So when you emboss lino into clay, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when it goes into the surface, when you try to pull it out, if you use these channels to carve, then that pinches in on a clay so it's hard to pull it out. So just like mold making, it's not quite an undercut, but there's just enough section where it might not want to release very well. So just use the V shapes and the sweeps and that way when you emboss into the surface, it pulls out nice and clean. Now with these V's and these sweeps, um, you know, they get closer together or they get wider and shorter and that dictates how uh, deep the line is or wide the line is. So when you're choosing the, when you're choosing the gouges, you're thinking about line quality. How thin or thick do you want your line? I tend to work with my thinner gouges first. And, and again, with, when, you're, when you're carving, all of you are gonna, there's not like a certain style that you should do for carving. Um, you're gonna carve in a way that you're creating the image that, that you want. Some people take more away in terms of opening up their image. Some, it's just a lot of line work in there um, because of the cr uh, texture it creates. I'm kind of in the middle where I have a little bit of both, but as you start to carve your imagery and you st figure out what your style is, then you're gonna decide, well, this is how I want to carve. Cause just like drawing, that's gonna make what you have uh, look unique. Um, so what I like to do is use my thinnest one and I do have multiple handles. So then that way the gouge for this, as it gets dull, I have the replacements the uh, ends come off and then it has, you know, you can store them in there. 
So that way, because when you buy one of these, you just normally get one and then you get all the different tips to use. So if this is something you're going to do a lot of, it's just easier to have, you know, a handle for each different gouge you have. So that way I can just put one down and, and just keep working. So the way that I like to do it is just use my thinnest one first and then wherever my um, drawing is, what I'm doing now is I'm carving just on the edge of that line. Now this is where my image starts to change. And I mentioned earlier that one of the things that I like about printmaking is that it transforms your image. So, because when you're drawing it, you know, this is just a nice, um, you know, pencil drawing, but the line is thin. And there's things that I can do with a pencil that would give me a certain kind of image. But when I carve it, that's going to translate this image now. Because now this line has to be a raised area to be dark. But then everything in between, I have to decide what am I going to do with that, right? Um, I don't want to empty that all out so it's a big void. I don't want it to look like a big open stamp. So I need to think about what kind of line quality do I want to have in there to create something that it maybe looks more hair-like. I tend to do more of a, I'm more of a contour carver. So once I have my primary lines, then I start to follow those. So I have the, the chin done here. So for, so the nose, I tend to work also from the inside out. So if I have some small pieces, I'll carve those areas first. So then that way, if I have to adjust outward, I have room. If I carve from the outside in, then sometimes you might start to crowd stuff or, or lose room to carve some details. So, so I'll just start up here and so again with the contour, you know, following my contours, I'm just wanting to create movement. And you see I'm, you know, I'm not really pushing that hard. And something like this I do like to, it's kind of like when you're even cutting wood, um, like it's easier to move the wood. So here I can, and it's easier to move the block so I'm not turning as much. So with this, whatever I think the features are or where they're going, this is just kind of reinforcing that movement. And for me, this is where it starts to maybe change and, and turn into something. So however I think that surface is moving, if I think it's curved, you know, then I want to put some curved lines on there. Because this is all about having um, a variety of line go into a variety of directions. Because if all your lines are going the same way, then your eyes are also going to go all the same way. So I'm also trying to think about, <clears throat> excuse me, line direction. So here, oh, go ahead. Okay, when I'm at the call, can you hear me okay? There's something wrong with my mic. One. Okay. Uh, when I add the coal, I cut it at a diagonal. And I don't have to score it. I just put slip on both sides and kind of smush it together like that. And I don't get air bubbles. Okay, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> I thought we were going to go back equal time. <laughs> so, so there's more of that, right? I, I could, you know, this would take me about, you know, 40 minutes to, to finish, but kind of gives you the idea with that. <clears throat> so with this one, I've already, um, I'm not, I know I'm supposed to kind of be slow. So with this one, what I was doing here, I've already done here, where I've just made all my line and... As I'm carving, as you, as you saw me doing there, I'm kind of discovering like the different features of the face. There's going to be parts of the face that come forward where the cheeks are. And so I want to kind of mimic, you know, that kind of movement. Now, the nice thing about printmaking is I don't have to get this to a finished place. All I have to do is get it where I think I'm doing okay now. So, and that's when I do a, a proof print. So, the nap, so what I'll do now, and this will be a way for me to, to demo that too is I'll go ahead and proof this just to see what it looks like. <clears throat> and I was talking to, um, so Kathy King's a real good friend of mine, and um, she's asking me, you know, what I might, what I might be doing. Because she knows me well, and she knows I'm not a planner. <laughs> so she, <laughs> I think she was concerned. I was, <laughs> I 
I didn't have this well thought out. And, and she, what, not too far off the mark, actually. But the thing about printmaking is I have all this stuff, right? So I don't have to have a grand plan. I just, it just has to form, right, as I'm going. And I feel that this is a, a welcoming crowd, and you'll be forgiving if I, <laughs> if I uh, get a little off track with some of the things. But what I did is, um, what I wanted to do was, um, again, walk through the process a little bit. Because I know what, what I'll be doing, like James is going to end up, you know, with some, some wonderful works. I might. Because <laughs> mine is a little bit more technique driven, where um, I'm, I'm showing you all these steps and all these techniques. And they will make things, but I'm not actually making a piece on purpose. So I don't have a goal in terms of tomorrow I'm going to have this thing. I'll have lots of things that will probably be a result of the processes that I've been showing. So just, you know, fair warning on that. But, <laughs> but it will be something that um, will be interesting to see. So I'm going to um, use some newsprint. So newsprint is really good to proof with because newsprint has a similar porosity as clay. So that way, it's going to look a little bit different on clay, but this will give me a better idea of how it's kind of absorbing it. Because I'm going to be using underglazes to, um, so this is just a black underglaze, and I'm going to use a foam roller to apply it. So let me just tear this. So we have, see we're getting more people. So, so with the group here that's now, how, any, how many of you are familiar with printmaking? Okay. How many of you relief printing specifically? Okay. How about screen printing? How about mono printing? Okay. It's not bad. It seems to be growing every year, and I think that's great. Um, printmaking gives you the ability to, you know, repeat an image over and over. Now, it's not for everyone. Um, I use it very specifically in terms of creating narratives to tell these stories, but you might just want to use it for pattern and design, you know, something that you can fill a background up uh, quickly with. All right, so I am going to always roll this up over here because later on, I don't have a clock, I guess. So if I look at my phone, I'm not expecting a phone call. It's just, that's my watch. So I want to make sure I'm staying on track. Okay, so I'm at the stage where I've added a coil to the rim, and I'm going to center the coil onto the, the clay beneath it. And I don't force it. I just slowly let the wheel turn and center it between my fingers. Excuse me. Oh. Yes, yes. I'd like to ask a question. On the your inside, did you throw that or, um, separately, or did you sort of start it like as a, a donut? I started it like a donut. Okay. Yes. So I, Thank you. I centered a, a big piece of clay, and then I split it at the, okay. at the wall and made two pieces and t pulled it up like a donut. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. So you can see that it's slowly beginning to center now. All right. Me again. Um. <laughs> well, what I'll, yeah. I'm going to print this real quick. Let me just say this real quick. So this is just a plain foam roller that you just get in a hardware store um, because this is all water-based. So if you use the uh, brayer, a rubber brayer, a rubber roller, um, the underglaze won't stick to it. So these foam rollers you can get because that, you know, I'm kind of using it just like a sponge. So with this, now the rest of this though is sort of what you would do for regular printmaking relief is where I've taken underglazes and I've let them, let them thicken up a little bit. Um, some underglazes are a little thinner, you know, very brushable um, out of the container. Some are a little bit thicker, I mean, depending on what you use. Um, but for printing purposes, you want to do a little bit on the thicker side, a, bit, a little bit like honey. Um, 
So with this, you take a little bit, I t take a spoon and just kind of put it across the top, you know, make a bead, it's called, and then I'm just kind of pulling it down and making a bed. So I've already had this all loaded up, and then what I'm trying to do is, the way that the bed looks is how your roller should look. So if I have too much underglaze on the surface, then I'm gonna have a lot of underglaze on my roller, so that means when I roll this up, it's gonna over, it's gonna overdo it. So, so I don't need a lot, so I'm just pulling it down. So when I have this, um, I think you can, can you see this? I guess, it's, probably see it well enough. Um, it's absorbed into there, but I don't have anything like physically sitting on the surface. So that's what I'm trying to avoid. Now I'm going to print this, I'm going to print this two different ways actually. Um, so this is a Baron, and which is the, you know, the more common tool. So I'm going to print it with a Baron because it's small. So when I'm doing this, you're not trying to get it all in one pass. And you don't want to press hard either, because just like a sponge, if I press too hard, then it'll push underglaze into the uh, carved areas, and I don't want that. It's going to happen, though. The thing about printmaking is that you have to do a lot of proofs. It, it almost never works the first time, um, which is good, you know, because when I'm demonstrating, then I can just blame it on the process. <laughs> so I'm not doing the whole thing because I still have carving to do. So once I have a nice layer on here, and I think, I don't know what, can you guys? Oh, there you go. So once you have a nice layer on here, I'll rotate it this way. So I'm just not sure what that looks like. Okay, so it's a little shiny, and that's what you want. If it was kind of dry, that meant that there's not enough material there to actually transfer. Again, I don't want a lot on there, but if there's a little shine on there, a little sheen, then I know there's enough. So when I'm proofing, I'm, I'll take the paper and I'll just put it on top. And typically, I don't want to drop it flat on just in case I don't drop it perfectly. It's kind of just always having an edge on the surface and just let it lay down. And then just lightly rub it. All right, so. Now, I'm not pressing real hard, but I can cheat. Like, I can peel it up a little bit to see how it's transferring. That looks okay. Get a little bit more there. So, so not too bad in terms of a, of a proof. So it's a little heavy, actually. It's nice and dark, but it's a little bit heavy. So this is where I start to get a sense of what's the, you know, what's kind of, what's the thickness that I'm working with with my ink uh, or with my underglaze and how hard do I need to press and all that. So now these lines are you know, kind of thin, so it looks very even. So my next step now is looking at this, I need to start to open this up. Like I want the face to be a little bit lighter, so I'm gonna go in with some wider gouges and start to open that face up a little bit more. I do want the hair to have texture in there, so I'm kind of fine with these lines. I might go in there and put some more fine lines in there, but I'll carve away a little bit more so there's more um, surface. And, and this is, yeah. uh, again, a really great way needle, to work be tool. because every time that you do a print, you kind of sneak up to how you want it to look. So I'll print it one more time because um, I have these presses as well that I've been using um, recently. So I'm just gonna ink this up a little bit. So if any of you have done relief printing, you know what a, a clamshell press um, is. You know, it's hinged on one side and then when you press it down, um, you know, it just you know, presses like this. So if you try to put clay in there and do that, it always pinches the edge of the slab. Um, so this, this press, these are new, so it's pretty, um, so I just got, got a couple recently to try, um, and they do work with clay, so I'm going to use these to print on clay as well once, once I get these um, set. So with this press, now this is wood, but I went ahead and put a piece of plastic on here since I will be printing on clay, so then that way it doesn't you know, get clay all over the wood. So that way when I print on paper, um, you know, my, my printing beds are still clean. So I'm just gonna put a piece of paper down. Then I'll take, is this, can you see this? Okay. So I'll put a piece of paper down, put the block on here, and I'll go ahead and put the newsprint on again. And then this comes with a, you know, it's just called a little blanket. So you put that on top. So the difference with this is 
instead of a clamshell, when this comes down, the whole plate kind of hangs loose. So that way it adjusts to the thickness of what's below it. So when it comes down, it's hinged here, but these two arms go underneath here. So when I'm pressing, the pressure's in the middle. And that's the key thing for us, for clay, is that you know, we need the pressure to go straight down and not from the edge. So just press down once. I'm sorry, is it a linoleum block that you have carved or what? Correct. Is it? it is a linoleum block. Thank you. So, yeah, so that's lino. So here's, so the difference that you can see is um, with the press, um, I have even pressure across the entire surface. When I'm doing it by hand with the Baron, it still comes out pretty good, but you can see that, you can see where the uneven pressure was, where it was a little bit lighter, a little bit heavier in terms of how I was pressing it. So, I mean, this is still fine, but now that I have this, that's, that's really fine. <laughs> so, so these are things that, um, but I do a lot of printmaking, right? So for me, it's, it's worthwhile having one of these. Um, but printmaking is all about printing with pressure and keeping that pressure even to have the um, consistency of color across the surface. So, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll probably keep carving just a little bit more on this um, and do another proof a little bit later because I think it's, what is it, like 10? So I have a couple hours. Okay. So, so I'll put this aside and then I'm going to um, probably, are you getting ready? I was going to ask a question. Are they going to show slides that, that we sent? Or will they be shown? We sent slides of our work. We did. Didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. Would, would they be shown? Anybody? Of actual, we showed, we sent slides of actual work <laughs> that show a progression of work. Not on the website. They, no, there should there be images going be on images. the outside screens, I suppose. Yeah, there's. James, be. we're checking into that right now because okay. they should theoretically be showing on these screens. So yeah. We're working on that. That way we could tell stories and show you examples of what we're talking about. So, were you getting ready to say something, James? Um, I'm going to add another call to the outside rim. Um, my, uh, I give credit to my, my parents for my interest in, in you know, spirituality and creativity. My, my mother uh, and father were, were makers. My mother made quilts and my father fashioned uh, many of his own farm tools. Um, Oh, good. Oh, okay. So that's my my mother and my great grandmother and my grandmother. Uh, my mother believed that the color of your clothes could influence your emotional state. She believed that red and orange could uh, improve your emotional state. So my father believed like, that the color of change, uh, painting our house green would ensure a good harvest. So if, if you can imagine six kids, three girls and three boys running around a green house dressed in red and orange, <laughs> that, uh, that's my upbringing. Also uh, making mud castles and mud pies. <laughs> so, yeah. it was really an exciting time growing up. You can just lean in against there. And especially uh, during the 60s and 50s in rural Alabama. Uh, during the turbulent 50s and 60s. So when I got a chance to go to undergraduate school in Kansas City, it could have been the distance between 
the moon and the earth, <laughs> socially, politically, culturally, it was great. I was surrounded by incredible art students and art faculty. And then I went to graduate school at Indiana, Univer Indiana University, and that was great. Um, my first teaching job was at Hampton University in Hampton, Virginia. Did I hear a whoop? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> great. Indiana University. Okay, so I'm gonna roll out a coil of clay and make a coil. I'm not gonna say anything right now. <laughs> Gotta work. All right, I will, um, okay. I have some screens that I've already burned, some small screens. Um, there's different kind of, I like to use UV screens, um, just they're quick, you don't need a certain setup, <clears throat> excuse me, to do it. So there's a product called PhotoEase, um, you know, easy screens. Uh, they're really nice, I use those a lot. Um, uh, Speedball makes a version of those as well, these are called speed screens. Uh, so they're a different color, but these, um, they have a UV, they have a LED UV light and it only takes, I think like a minute, maybe a minute and a half to expose these. Um, <clears throat> so it's just like the PhotoEase where it comes already uh, pre-coated with the UV emulsion. So you just have a black and white image, just a photocopy, and then you uh, use that photocopy as your negative, and then you have the UV light over top for about a minute and a half, rinse it in water, and, and you're done. So it's a nice quick process where you don't need Diazo sensitive emulsion. So, um, it kind of is, I think, that when I, th I have some images too and it might have a little bit of that. Um, so UV screens, so with Diazo sensitive emulsion, um, it's, a, it's a different kind of light to, um, to harden the emulsion. So UV sensitive emulsion just can use sunlight or UV bulb. So that way it makes it a little bit easier sometimes. You can expose it outside or indoors, but you don't need a negative. You can just have a regular piece of paper. Um, it doesn't have to be on a transparency. Exactly. So, so say, so if I was going to expose one of these, you know, this is brown, but pretend it's black, right? <laughs> so this would be black, and then you would ha also have your screen, and then you would have your image. So this is black. I put the, the screen down, emulsion side up, and when you take it out of the envelope, it has a protective film on there, so you peel that off the emulsion. So you put that down, and then you'll take your black and white photocopy, and then you'll put that face down onto that. Uh, and then you take a piece of, I like to use just glass, and make sure it's not UV protected glass, because then it never is, or you can use plexiglass as well, and then you put that on top, and that sandwiches that together, so that way, um, you know, your, your photocopy is directly contacting the, the UV. So the light is about 14 inches above it, and I believe it's about a minute, no longer than two minutes that you turn it on. So wherever the black line is, that's blocking the light, and wherever the paper is white, then the light passes through and it hardens the emulsion that creates the stencil. Correct. Now in the sun, I've not done it in the sun. Uh, I mean, I, I live in Chicago, and so it's, you know, it's, <laughs> Uh, I stay inside, right. um, but you know, the sun is, it's kind of unpredictable the time of year that this expo exposure changes a little bit, uh, you know, winter, summer in terms of the strength of the sun. So if you're out in the sun, you know, it's more like, like with photoes, it's about seven minutes. It's still not a long time, um, but you can do that. So you just have to play with the timing a little bit. Um, but with the UV light, you can just do it indoors and if it's nighttime raining. And then, so once that's done, then you take it out and then you put it in water. And then the water um, stops it from hardening. And then um, 
And then you rinse that out and then the unhardened emulsion, you know, rinses out. Um, they sell this as a kit. Like if you get the speed, they're called speed screens and it comes with, with all those directions in there too as well. But that, that's the quick, the quick version of it. Now the nice thing about it though is that they're loose, right? So I can use these. So I don't need to flop my image, right? So with this block, you know, I had to flip that image to, to make her looking two different ways. With this one, I can just print it this way and I can turn it over and, and print it that way. So I don't have to reverse, you know, because you can print either side, it doesn't matter. If it's in a frame, then of course that's the orientation that you need to do. Uh, the nice thing also about screen printing is what you see is what you get. So if I put this down on a piece of paper and I print it, pull it away, that's, that's the orientation of the print, you know, versus a relief print, you know, I, when I print it, it's reversing it. So silk screening is the only process that doesn't reverse the image. All of the other ones do reverse it. That being said, <laughs> I'm going to print it on a plaster bat, which will reverse my image. <laughs> so, um, so one of the reasons I do like plaster bats is because I can do anything with these. So what I'm going to do now is print on this plaster bat, you know, this small screen I'm going to go ahead and, and print on here. So for something small, um, I like to use a, a sponge, actually. Squeegees are good, but with, with a loose screen, if you use a squeegee, then it moves around a lot. Now, you can you know, tape these up and frame them, but um, I mean, I make these loose screens on purpose, so then that way I can use them in different ways. And like if I wanted to do it on a vertical surface, you know, anything that I can push that around, you know, I can print directly onto. So with this, let me put a glove on. No, as you know, underglazes don't hurt your skin or anything, but I want to keep my hand clean. I have a question for James. Uh-huh. Um, <clears throat> the part that you're adding onto now looks kind of like rather thin. How uh -huh. do you keep that heavy coil from, you know, warping it or bending it down? Is it, is it drier than it looks? Like when did you throw that? I, I threw that uh, last night and I, uh, oh, hi. <laughs> I, I, I dried it with a, a, a heat gun, so it's, it's hopefully strong enough not to fall down. Okay. And after I add this coil, I'm going to get Brent to dry it more so that right. I can add another coil, and I'll work on this piece. Great. To yeah. the link that they sent me. Thank you. Uh-huh. They sent me. James, could you also talk about how you place the coil? Like, are you centering it right now? And yes, I'm, I'm centering it on the, the piece beneath it. And then I'm going to uh, slowly turn the wheel and center it and pull it up. Thanks. And cut off any unevenness. So, so the question was, are these just underglazes? Have I modified them? Um, these are just underglazes at the moment. Um, I, do, I dry them out, like I'll pour, I'll pour them in like containers like that and let them sit out overnight or sometimes a couple of days to let them get to the thickness that I want. Um, lots of times I'll get the, to the thickness that I want and I don't need to do anything to them. If I feel that they're still a little bit um, not quite the body that I want, then what I'll do is I'll add, um, this is a, a transparent base, it's an acrylic transparent base. It's a clear screen printing ink. Uh, screen printing ink is acrylic based. Um, you can buy oil based, it's as a specialty, but as a general supply, it, it's not readily available. Um, it used to be, but, if, but when you're screening, all those oil fumes were coming up and they were making people sick. So that's why it's, it's all acrylic now in terms of like commercially purchasing it. So this just burns out in the kiln. I mean, this doesn't, this doesn't do anything at all to the surface, to the underglazes. You can mix it in glazes. But this, 
whenever you modify something, then what you're modifying has to be thicker than the modifier, right? So this is kind of like a honey consistency. So if this is, um, you know, thinner than a honey consistency, then that's going to cut this. So I need, to, I need what I'm going to modify to be thicker than what's in this container because I want to bring my underglaze to the viscosity and to the body that this has. So that's why, you know, just let them dry out, you know. Um, sometimes I let it get like the consistency of like icing, um, like a whipped icing kind of. And then when you add the transparent base to it, it makes it nice and smooth and it, ha and it stands up, you know, like a bead as well. Now that's more important for if you're using a squeegee to pull it. So that way when you have a bead, you have this nice physical, um, like this physical ink to pull across. Since I'm using a sponge to print, um, it doesn't need to be as, as thick. Um, so with these, these are, um, so has anyone printed with a sponge before? Okay. I know it's, it, it sounds unusual, I know, but because um, clay's tricky, right? Even when you smooth the slab out really well, there's sometimes little divots here and there. So if you use a blade to um, print on there, it's only going to print on all the high spots. So sometimes you might have a void or two where the clay might have dipped down. When you're using a sponge, it's going to conform to the surface a bit more. So it kind of helps out with that. Um, so so this is, um, these are these mud tools, um, the workhorse sponges. Um, I always use these because these absorb very similar to the foam rollers. So I'm looking at this and I'm wiping it off and I have this piece of paper because I'm kind of wiping it and I can see now it's, it's laying, down, laying it down a little bit better. Because at first it has to, I want it to absorb into there. I don't want it on the outside. So these are new so you know, it takes a few minutes for it to, to soak in. But once it's soaked in, then I'll wipe off the excess. So now it kind of looks a bit more um, so now it looks a bit more like that sponge where physically I don't have underglaze on the outside of the sponge. It's, it's absorbed in. And now I'm just going to, you know, wipe on, you know, wipe, wipe on, wax off. So it's that same kind of thing, the original, you know, Karate Kid. So now with this, sometimes you kind of want to go with the directions of your lines a little bit. Now this one's tricky because in the beginning, um, just always press too hard by mistake, you know, because you're trying to force the material through. Now I use some painter's tape to um, attach it so I can print it and then the same thing, I can cheat a look. I can peel it up to see how it's going and if I feel like it didn't go through someplace, then I can go in and do that area. So, so that's the other thing I can't do with a, sc a framed screen. You know, once I print, I have to take the whole screen off and, and what I have is what I have. But, so I'm going to do that. So I'll print it this way because I think that's, okay. So just loading it up, and I'm not pressing hard, I'm just kind of, and you also don't want to do like a sponge print, I'm not pressing straight down, it is going to be a sweeping motion. So I just want to make sure I get all the areas, and now like I said, I'll peel it back to kind of see how it's looking. Whoop, let me get the edge of the pot there. Yep. There we go. I want to get his head, but I'm not going to mess with it. Look at that, okay. My pot's done, James. That's cool. <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> I can't throw fast, but I can print a pot fast. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, that's good. I, you know, when you're printing like this, it's 50-50. It's I either look like I know what I'm doing or I don't. Um, so I'm glad that worked out. Now, <laughs> now, now that I'm done with this, um, if this dries in here, it's perfectly fine. I just use a sponge to, to clean it out. Now, same thing, I'll just use a sponge now to clean this out and then I just have to let it air dry, It'll take about another 10 minutes and then I can you know, start, start printing again. So, so these are really nice. Um, maybe later on I'll just make a, like a cylinder, like I just hand build a, a cylinder so that way I can show how to print on a curved surface. 
Um, I'll have to do that tomorrow though because it's going to have to dry out to, to be printable. But, um, but that is the advantage of having um, what's called a loose screen is because whatever surface I can put it around to make contact, then I'm just using a sponge uh, to print it on there. Okay. okay, so now the other thing I wanted to do, my other goal is to do so much that by noon you're just utterly confused. <laughs> then you have to come back tomorrow and ask me questions. I have a question right now um, for I'm you, afraid Paul. Of so real <laughs> fast Can I ask a quick question? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so that was on a plaster bat, right? Correct. Um, but would the idea be that you could actually do the same thing on like a piece of bisque? Yeah. Correct. Okay, so that's, okay, I just wanna make sure. Yep. Okay. So yeah, I would do the exact same thing on bisque and that's the beauty of it. And you can do that with glaze too. Um, so yeah, if that was just a, a bis slab, the process would be exactly the same. Um, now if it was bist, and then I could maybe roll a, you know, just like roll an underglaze on there, um, then I could also then just take glaze. Now if you make glaze from scratch, then you know, do your recipe and then just add water slowly because you, you want it to be on the thick side and then add the transparent base to it to bring it to the consistency you want. Um, and then you can just do the same thing with glaze. You can just you know, print glaze as well. So this isn't restricted just to underglaze. You can print anything. You just have to print the appropriate ceramic material for the firing temperature that you're going. So this has nothing to do with cones or you can fire it any way you want. I mean, I, <clears throat> I mostly fire around, you know, like, a, like cone two, cone three and down, but it can be on cone 10. You know, as long as, because all these underglazes go up, you know, to those temperatures. Um, I love doing it with Raku as well. You know, I just put like a clear crackle on there and then Raku them because it works a bit like a, just a regular clear. Um, really great for soda firing. I mean, soda gives beautiful, you know, pulls out some richness on it. So, so with these processes, you're not restricted to, um, like you can do atmospheric firing, you can do electric firing, gas firing, fire any way you want. It's just use the right clay body and then the right glazes or underglazes. And then this is just merely a tool now to transfer an image or a design to the surface uh, beforehand. Um, so the other thing I'm gonna start doing is I have a drawing that I was working on, but I'm not gonna use the whole thing uh, what I wanted to do is show how to do, um, has, has anyone used a drawing fluid and screen filler? Okay, because I love drawing fluid and screen filler. I like, I like processes that have a little bit of immediacy to them. And now uh, this process allows me to have my own drawing style with that. So with this, I just have a, um, just an open screen. And then what I want to do is, I mean, I was going to do the whole thing, but that's just, that's just too much time. So I'm just going to grab this guy. So what I want to do is put this image into this screen. So you can take a drawing, you can take a photocopy, you know, whatever you want your image to be. And then you just put it onto the surface and then you put your screen over top of it. Because this is the orientation that I want to print um, this character. So that way I have it the way I want to see it. Because remember with screen printing, what you see is what you get when it's in the frame. So now that I have um, this drawing here, I'm just going to trace the drawing with a pencil so that the pencil drawing is now gonna be in my screen. And that's how I, I transfer it there. Now, if you had a photograph um, and you wanted to trace that, so whatever image you have, whatever pattern or design, um, just put it face down onto it. And then, like I said, I'll use a pencil and I'll trace this. When I'm done tracing this, I'm going to use um, drawing fluid. Um, because when I get done tracing, I'm going to do it right away. So that way, um, you know, if James is, you know, talking, you'll know what I'm doing. So this is, it's basically, think of like wax resist. So wherever I put the drawing fluid, I'm going to pull screen filler on top. This won't stick to the drawing fluid. Then the screen filler literally fills in the rest of the screen. So wherever I want color to go through the screen, that's where I want to brush this material. Um, takes about 15, 20 minutes for it to dry, and then I just pull the screen filler on. And then as soon as that's dry, which is maybe about 20, 30 minutes, you know, depending on what it's like in here, then it's ready to print. So it's, it's a fairly quick process in terms of you know, getting an image in there and then using it. 
Uh, when it is done, it's going to be, it's going to look like, it's going to look like this. So, so this is the same image as this. And I told you I, I appropriate myself. <laughs> so I drew this image for a bigger piece. And then, but I first worked with the image. So this is done with the screen, with the drawing fluid and screen filler. So where the screen is open, that's where the drawing fluid was. And where it's the, the reddish color, that's, that's the screen filler. So I took the image, you know, put it in Photoshop, reduced it, and then printed it on a piece of paper. So that way I could burn it into a speed screen so I could have it loose to do on other things, right? So that's what I'm going to be doing here. So I'm going to go ahead and draw the image with pencil, then I'm going to use the drawing fluid then to, you know, trace my uh, lines, and then I'm going to coat it. <laughs> James? Yes. <laughs> Am I supposed to keep talking? <laughs> <laughs> Ask me some questions, people. Are those your tools that you're using? They're just tools uh, that, that work. They're things that, <laughs> that I collect. Um, these are uh, tools that you work on the floor with, scraping tools. Uh, this is a tool that uh, one of my Vietnamese students made me. I got a Fulbright, Fulbright grant to teach in Vietnam, and one of my students made this as a gift. Uh, so they're just a collection of things that work. Um, I, uh, I'll tell you a story about when I went to Vietnam to teach. I taught at the Ho Chi Minh City University of Architecture. And um, I taught architectural drawing and architectural ceramics. And it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I went over thinking that it would be difficult because I couldn't speak Vietnamese very well. I took classes so I could, you know, say hello, xin chào, and I could say enough if they were trying to feed me or no thank you, things like that. So. That was okay, but I thought that I would be not treated well because I'm war age, but I didn't get any of that. And I bought a motorcycle to get around town. And Ho Chi Minh City is a city of eight million people. And I got lost. And I couldn't read the map. So one day, while I was lost, uh, they have these motorcycle drivers who, they're essentially a, a taxi driver on a motorcycle. And he was sleeping on his motorcycle and I went over and asked for direction. He didn't speak English. And I showed him my car to my hotel and he, got on his motorcycle and he beckoned me to follow him and it took an hour, I was so lost, to get back to the <laughs> hotel. And I tried to pay him and he wouldn't take any money. That's just how nice they were to me. And one time I was walking at the, in the park and a Vietnamese man came up to me and he took out his wallet and he showed me a tattered photo of himself with a GI soldier. And he asked me if I knew his friend. He was a black GI soldier. 
<laughs> and I, I said, no, I don't know, I don't know him. And then he invited me to his home and introduced me to his family. And I'm telling you this story just how, to show you how friendly and what a wonderful experience I had over there. But that experience and the colors that I saw and the temples made me interested in using gold luster in my work. So some of the forms that you're seeing, that you will see with the gold luster, it came from that, emulating the, the temples that I saw and the colors that I saw in the fields. So a lot of my work is influenced by, by memories. Um, I had an experience where I was invited to be a resident artist in Hong Kong. And my daughter and I went over during spring break. She went with me uh, traveling during her Christmas vacation. I was going to be there for a semester, and she was going to be there just for the Christmas holiday. So we got there early in the morning, two o'clock in the morning. I had jet lag, and it felt like I was drunk. And I had to give a lecture at two o'clock that afternoon in a workshop. And when I gave the lecture, I was sleepy and forgetting my many of the stories, and not, it was not going very well. And most of the people in Hong Kong, they speak Cantonese and English. But I noticed that there was a gentleman who was dressed in a nice suit. He looked very distinguished, very important. And my lecture was being translated from English into Mandarin. I had taken a little bit of uh, Mandarin, so I, I knew the difference. And uh, my daughter was trying to help me. And she said, Dad, uh, tell the story of when you got lost in the desert and how that influenced your work. <laughs> and so I got back on track and I told the story. And I'll, I'll tell you that story later. So after the lecture was over, the man came over with his translator and he said, I understand your work. He said, you collect memories. He said, I want to give you a memory. He said, I want to invite you to Jintazen, China. He said his daughter, whose name was Bahan, would travel with me for 15 days, and he was specific, 15 days, <laughs> to travel to specific important places in China to give me memories that I could use for influence. And I didn't believe him. So I said, yes, okay. And I just kind of forgot about it. But I got back on, you know, my path of making pots while I was in Hong Kong. And my daughter went back home to Texas. She was a student at San Angelo State University. And a month later, I got a notice from 
the gentleman's name was Bawan, inviting me to Genta Zen. So I went, met his daughter, very wonderful young lady who could speak perfect English, but she wanted me to teach her slang. And I didn't know any slang hardly, so I taught her, yep, and shut the front door. So we had a lot of fun, especially when she understood the term, what it meant. And we would be talking and she would say, James, shut the front door. So, <laughs> but we would go to villages that had never seen an African-American potter. And whenever we would go and it was time to make a pot, she would say, James, it's time for you to show your action now. <laughs> so I would have to make a pot. And there's a picture somewhere in that group of me making a pot using a potter's wheel that had a, a, a hole in the bat or in the, the flywheel. And you would take a stick and you'd catch the hole and then you'd do it like this and then make a pot. So that was a lot of fun. So I'm telling you that story because uh, there, there are stories connected to most of my pots. So I'm, I collect memories. So when I retired in 2018, I wrote a book called Reflections Made of Memories. And it contains stories of my work that relates to 35 years of teaching at Texas Tech University. Did you get to the temples in Angkor Wat and did that affect you? I, I, I did, and I'll tell you a story about that. Um, I got another fellowship to go to Angkor Wat, Laos, and Vietnam. And part of that fellowship was to create an exhibition. I don't know if anybody's ever been to Cambodia. You have, they call it the, the country of one dollar. Do you remember that? You, did you hear that term? Because, and that's, it's not a flattering term. It's a country where there's lots of poverty and it had unbelievable abuse and you can still see it. And so I had to make some art related to my experience and a lot of what I saw was really agonizing. But the temples were unbelievable. And the banyan trees, those huge trees that are supporting some of the, the temples and the colors of the temples and the people still look like the temples. And there should be images coming up if they haven't already come up of uh, the people and the temples. So I agonized for months on how to make art that showed beauty and was intriguing. So I made these double wall platters, big platters, and I used gold and I used um, cyber firing technique using um, stannous chloride, not stannous chloride, but um, ferric chloride and aluminum four sagger and uh, created these wonderful platters. Maybe they, did they come up already? Did you see those with the, and the elongated uh, swans or sandhill crane shapes made them more lyrical, em emulating the banyan trees. But you can see the gold from the, the images that I saw in Vietnam and Cambodia.
Okay, so uh, Brent, if, if I'm going to let this just roll, and if you could dry that part that I made, and I'm going to start working on that piece. No, this is not a clay body that I use uh, at home. I mix my own clay. Uh, my clay has more um, grog in it. This is a very tight clay body and it's, it's a little bit different to work with than the clay that I use at home. When you're making the double walls, are you trying to keep them even or are you intentionally having the inner one a little taller? Yeah, I, I eventually, I want the top wall to be higher and I'm gonna eventually close it over to meet the outside wall. And I've learned that through trial and error. If you try to turn the inside wall over to meet the outside wall, they crack. Or, and if you meet them in the middle, they crack. So eventually, this one's gonna be a lot taller and it's gonna crack. Uh, meet at the outside wall. Okay, I'm going to change my <clears throat> tools to this wheel and make it dirty. Hey, James. Yes. Um, is the, do you add the double wall on all of your pieces, or is there a size where you uh, decide to not add it? Yeah. Uh, I'm, right now, I'm, I'm making two different types of work. Uh, and I have examples of the two. The piece that's on the, the, uh, the poster for Inseca, that's a single wall pot. And that's what I'm going to make here. This is going to be a single wall. And I call them my anthropomorphic forms because they uh, are referencing a figure. And it's going to be a single wall piece. So. This is a double wall, and this is going to be a single wall piece. Okay, thanks. Okay. James, when you made the foot on your other pot, did you throw a cylinder on the bottom and then cut out the arches? Yes, okay. yes. And then whenever you put the holes in, I missed the beginning of this. Was uh -huh. it at a leather hard state? That was when it was in the leather hard state, and it goes all the way through to the double wall between the two walls. So that's gonna be the, the part that releases the air to keep it from blowing up. Okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. So James, are you throwing very, um, with minimal water? And if you get water in there, do the holes help drain that so it doesn't pool? Or If do any water goes in, I, I get, get it out with a sponge. Okay, I, I just didn't. Yeah. yeah, I don't want any water inside. Right. Uh-huh. I'm going to, um, so with this, because it's almost, so it's 10 of, so what I want to do is I'm going to, um, just to show you the process of, of pouring um, casting slip on here, because uh, this, this dries pretty fast. Uh, the nice thing about using plaster is once you put underglaze on there, it, then it wicks the water out of it. So as soon as it's dry to the touch, then you can actually start to go and you know, work on there a little bit more. So what I want to do now is go ahead and I was going to bring over a little slab and I'm going to put some walls on here. So I used the drawing fluid to um, draw that image. So it's the same thing, now I'm just waiting for that to dry. And when that does dry, um, then I'm going to use a scoop coater and pull the um, screen filler on top. I'm just looking. And then once that's done, then that just needs to, to dry and then you just simply rinse out the drawing fluid and then that's all complete. 
So what I'm going to do, um, I have a graph ruler. I like graph rulers because I can make quick cuts with them, you know, by using the, the measurements inside. So typically I just cut it an inch tall. So these walls I'm going to put around the perimeter of the piece and that'll keep the casting slip in place. Now regardless of how large the plaster bat is that I have an image on, um, I still only make my walls one inch tall um, because this, I know that way if I fill it up halfway, it's just a half an inch thick, right? So, because yeah, I, I don't need a lot of casting slip on here. So when you put the casting slip on, whatever the shrinkage rate is, you're trying to figure out, do you want it to be like a quarter inch or you only want it to be like the thickness of what a normal slab would be. It doesn't have to be really thick. And if anything, you can even pour it sometimes on the thinner side since you're casting it. So I'm just cutting these. Now, monoprinting is something that I didn't always do. Um, it's something that I started about, about, um, see, my son is 19, so I guess 19 years ago. Um, <laughs> as, um, you know, as, like some of the things that I do, do take some time to get done. So what happened is, you know, I got married and after we got married then. My wife got pregnant and then we had, had a kid. So once you have a baby then, um, I mean, I didn't know about it then, but you know, your time is no longer your own, right? <laughs> so I was in a bit of a quandary in terms of, well, how can I still make work with um, only having time available kind of in three hour increments, right? Because every three hours they're up, need to be changed, you know, things need to happen. So. But there's, I wanted to have a certain amount of time that I invested um, in making my work. So I had to come up with a way to work. And this is, uh, we lived in Pennsylvania at the time. So I wanted to come up with a way that I could work, that I could stop what I was doing and then you know, go help out. So, so we lived in Upland, Pennsylvania. It's a suburb of Philly. And... Um, the thing about that is what, you know, you just can't leave clay alone. You have to, you know, keep doing things. So I discovered that if I worked on my plaster bat, I could stop. Because it's one of the things that I'm always wanting to do, and I'm putting casting slip that I'm going to be using on the bottom of my clay wall because this is going to stick to the surface. The casting slip kind of acts like glue. I do make my own slip, but for, um, for this demo purposes, um, they sent some. Yeah, I make my own slip in my studio out of my hand building body. So when I'm hand building, whatever scraps that I have, I just put into a five gallon bucket and then I slake it down and deflocculate it and then I use that to, to, um, to work with. Hey, but Paul. for demos, it's Paul. slip doesn't travel well. <laughs> Paul, I don't want to okay. interrupt you, but if I could ask everyone to come to the microphone and ask your questions so that we can capture it on the video, that would be amazing. If not, Paul is answering a question that no one knows. What oh, that's right. <laughs> Well, sometimes that's the case anyway. <laughs> I don't always answer the question I'm asked. Um, so the question was, do I, you know, what kind of casting slip do I use, essentially? Um, any casting slip works. So you just, whatever cast, if you already use casting slip, just, you know, continue to use that. Um, I like to use my own clay body, so that way if I cast something, then I can also use it as, um, an element in anything that I'm doing in the studio. And I don't really have a big space, right? So I also have to, I don't have room to have a lot of different clay bodies and a separate kind of casting body and all that. So, oops. And you can deflocculate anything. You know, I, know, I typically use an earthenware body. Um, I like the color, I like the brown color. Um, 
I mean, part of the reason of using a brown body is because I have a brown body. So I like to have that reflect that too. That's part of my work where I want the color of the clay to kind of be, you know, my color. And I also do like the contrast that I get from it as well. Um, if I want to kick things up a little bit, then I can just put, you know, a lighter underglaze under something if I want to add some contrast. So, so it's nice and versatile for me. And I also just like the way it looks um, when it's fired. All right, so mm -hmm. I think, it's so if you can fun. see that. Okay, thank you. So again, no matter how big the bat is, it's the same thing. I just put this around a perimeter and you know, it's holding well. So this isn't very big, so I don't need to pour this very thick. So I'm just going to pour it, you know, I'll just pour it halfway. With it being thinner, it should um, hopefully, whoops. It should hopefully, uh, sheesh, this plastic is yes. making it run away. So I'm putting some in another container to pour. The slip is a little bit on the thick side, so it's not going to run quite mm. as nicely. Um, so so ha how many folks use casting slip? If you, okay. So a casting slip, typically you're going to take its um, specific gravity, so you have the proper ratio of, of water um, to clay. And, whoops, I want to knock that out. So, are you doing like, one, like 173 is sort of like a normal um, number for a specific gravity where you pour that into a volumetric mold, then it's able to wick water out of the side to build a wall thickness you want, and then you need to pour that back out. So at that specific gravity, the, um, the slip is a little bit thinner. Now, when you're just casting flat, I don't need to worry about pouring that back out. So I can get away with having it maybe, you know, 180 or 185. So, so that, means it's a, that means there's a bit more clay in there than water. Now, if I have it a touch higher, that means it's going to um, shrink less as well because there isn't as much water evaporating out of it. So... So that's, that also helps with any like warping or, or cracking problems. So I do have a bucket of, oh, here we go. I have an assortment of ribs. So when I pour this, I am going to, since it is a little bit thicker, I might need to spread it a little bit. So probably like everybody, I have a whole bunch of, you know, Michael Sherrill ribs. Mud full ribs. I like the green ones for this. They're a little stiffer. So I'm going to pour this casting slip. And so a casting slip, what you want to do is kind of like making pancakes where I want to choose one side and just let it flow. Like if I, st if I start pouring here and then I kind of come around the perimeter, then it's going to fold in on itself and it might leave a little crease there where the slip, where the two walls of the slip then come and meet. So I just want to pick one side, and then I just want it to flow across. So again, with this being a little bit thicker, it might not flow as nicely, but once I get the amount in, then I can take my rib and then coax it, coax it down. So if I just stay right behind it and just kind of pour right on the edge, it just naturally pushes it down, and that also pushes any air away also. It's actually not bad. So, you know, water finds its own level. So I don't have to, if it's thin enough, it will just level itself out. Um, what I didn't do is before I pour, typically I'll put a level on here to make sure this is level. Because if it isn't, then I could have a thick and a thin side on here. So, so I always want to put a level on there. I just have like a little bubble level um, to do that. So once that's poured, you just let it sit. So that's what I'll do with this. And I think it's like 11 o'clock. Does that sound right? Yep. Okay. Do you need to tap it to get rid of bubbles or anything the way you tap? No. Um, some people do, you know. I never say, like saying like a flat no, because then I get an email a month later. Guess what I did? Because um, <laughs> it always happens. As soon as you say you can't do something, then it's like a challenge. And then people figure it out. Um, 
but I don't. Um, one of the reasons it doesn't work quite as well is that the, no, the casting slip is kind of thick. So um, its own weight you know, should force the air out. Now this is, there wasn't any air bubbles in it when I poured it either. Now if you had just got done mixing it, um, like when you mix this, you wanna keep your blade low so it's more, so it kind of spirals in there, so it kind of rolls. You don't wanna get sort of like a vortex going where it's sucking air in. And so as long as you haven't introduced air bubbles to your casting slip, then when you're pouring it, you should be fine. Um, but yeah, so that is a good question though. You do have to be, have to be careful of that. With a plaster, you can, you know, knock the side a little bit to, you can burp your mold. Okay. All right, so since I have, um, since I have a slab out, so, okay, so what is it? It's 11, so we started at nine. All right, so I, I did something in clay, it just took me two hours <laughs> to do that. So what I'll do now though, is I'll go ahead and since I have a little slab here um, with the lino cuts that I already have carved, I'll go ahead and print um, directly onto the clay slab with that. One, one, okay. Um, I mentioned telling you the story. My, my daughter wanted me to tell the story of um, when I got lost in the desert and how that created a series of work. <clears throat> uh, I taught for 34 years in, in Junction, Texas at the Texas Tech Junction uh, Center. Anybody here took that class? Hmm. Who is that? Is that Roger? Hi, Vaughn, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, at one point, we used to take uh, a camping trip to Rattlesnake Canyon. And the, the operative word is rattlesnake. <laughs> okay? So we would, uh, on the syllabus, the students had to bring light camping gear. And uh, the reason, because in the Pecos wilderness, there are pictographs that natives made 4,000 years ago. And there are many, many uh, sites, sacred sites, where there are pictographs. And we would go uh, with the guidance of an anthropologist named Grant Hall. And we wouldn't disturb the, the sites, but we would go and look at them and find inspiration and uh, come back and make art. People who couldn't go, who physically couldn't make it, uh, they would stay at the campus. But the others, we would go and we'd camp out and we'd cook and, and we'd go look at the ancient campsites and, <laughs> Thanks. Uh, of the natives. And they were beautiful. I showed some photographs of them. So we'd all be influenced and we wouldn't copy the, the Indian uh, pictographs, but we would be influenced by it. The first time I went, I was invited by the daughter of the owner. His, her name was, uh, is Shelley Striplin, and she gave 11 artists hand-drawn maps to get to the sites, and you had to go through the Pecos Wilderness on back roads. Anybody ever been to the Pecos Wilderness? It's really rugged. You cross rivers and ravines and washes. So I left very early in the morning and I wanted to beat everybody. I had this uh, illusion that I would find uh, arrowheads and 
painted rocks and things like that. But I got lost. And I was too, uh, you know, bullheaded to turn around and go home, so I just kept going. And I came across a group of cowboys herding angora goats, beautiful goats. They make mohair out of the fur. I got out and uh, tried to talk to the cowboys who were herding them, and they didn't speak English, and so I thought I'd crossed over into Mexico. But I got back in my van, and I kept going, and I crossed uh, more washes and ravines, and then a snake crosses the road. It was the largest snake I'd ever seen outside of a zoo, a rattlesnake. And I ran over the snake and it sounded like a speed bump. It went boom, boom. So I, I got out of the van and I started looking for the rattlesnake, thinking that I was going to cut the rattle off and bring it back as a souvenir. <laughs> but I couldn't find the snake anywhere. So I started getting really paranoid, thinking that the rattlesnake had crawled into my van and was going to eat me alive when I got out. And so <laughs> I got back into the van and I thought, well, maybe I'll just camp out and when it gets light, I'll go back home. And then I came across a pile of rocks holding up a cardboard with my name, James, and an arrow pointing. <laughs> and so the other group had made it to the campsite and they were out looking for me. <laughs> and so that inspired a whole series of work <laughs> after that. So I have one piece that I've kept all those years and I call it snake crossing. <laughs> so. So that's where a lot of inspiration comes from. <laughs> Desperation. <laughs> Getting, lost. Getting lost. So I'm going to trim the bottom of this. It's a little wet. I normally wouldn't work this wet, but at a workshop, sometimes you don't have a choice. So this is going to be one of the anthropomorphic forms. Did you tell the story of in North Carolina and getting stuck or going up the mountain, having to get on the back of the truck to get up the hill? <laughs> no. Tell that story. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so, I, so this is, I guess, a continuation of the, of the Alternative Kilns book. So, um, so after all the text was written um, for the book, for the Alternative Kilns and Firing Techniques, we had to do the photo shoot um, for everything. Now, this was something that um, they invited everybody um, you know, who contributed as well to come down to do these firing processes. Because some of the processes were very specific to the artists. So, so Randy Broadnax and Don Ellis, who do the fuming. Um, that, that's not, has anyone ever tried that? The, the fuming technique? So that's not something that you kind of just like dabble in. <laughs> I mean, there's really specific timing uh, to make that work. So, so anyway, so all of us uh, went down to um, Asheville, North Carolina, and Rob Pullian at the time, um, you know, <laughs> you know, Lark Books, and um, so we were going to his place in Asheville to, to shoot it. So, so he had, and like everybody, it seems like in that Ashland and, you know, kind of Penland area, everyone like lives on like a mountain, right, <laughs> on top of a giant hill or something. So, but none of them are like paved, right? They're all just gravel. So back then I had a truck, I had a, um, 
a full-size pickup Chevy. Um, and then I didn't have a whole lot in there, but we were just all driving there. And, and Linda was there as well. So Linda had her white van. Um, and then I'm not sure what you were in James or Randy or, or Don, but I know I was in the back and we were like a train of cars and we were going up to Rob's place. So it's this hill that kind of goes up and then it's kind of windy. So, so when we got to it, we we're at the base of it and I was like, I don't think I can go up there. Um, and they're like, you're fine. You got a heavy truck. I was like, no, I'm, I'm afraid. <laughs> because once, because he said, once you get going, since it's gravel, you can't stop because you'll start to drift backwards, right? You just, you can't hit your brakes. That just makes it worse. So they're like, so they, he's like, keep it spaced out. So that way you can control that. I was like, I was like, well, then I'm going last because I don't want to be in front and get everybody else jammed up. So, so everybody gets in line and, you know, Linda goes up, her van's going fine, and all the other vehicles are going fine. I'm like, okay, this isn't too bad. So then I start, start heading up. And I have a, a, a stick shift, too, five speed, to, you know, just make it more challenging. So I get about halfway up, and then I'm losing traction a little bit. And then all of a sudden, I have no more traction, and then I'm, I'm sliding backwards down this hill. Now, these roads are, like, you know, just a little bit wider than these tables, right? So they're, and again, I'm from Delaware. It's pretty flat, right? We don't have... Like our driveways don't go like at 90 degree angles to get to the top for a quarter of a mile. So it turns, right? It's not even straight. So, so I'm starting to slide back. And then those guys are up there. I don't know what the conversation was, but they noticed I was no longer behind them. <laughs> so, so I'm sitting there. So then I see, um, so do any of you know Randy Broadnax or Don Ellis? Okay, so, so the three of them, those two and James, you know, start, start coming down because they, clearly they knew what happened. They knew I wasn't making it. So they come down and they're like, okay, well, you don't have anything in the back of the truck. And so, you know, we need to get some weight in there. And I'm like, what are we going to do for weight? And they're like, that's what the three of us are for. <laughs> so all three of them. Um, so, so two got in the back of the pickup and then one was pushing. So I'm in there driving. So we finally got it up. Um, you know, with the three of them doing that. And then when we got to the top, because we were going to be there for about, I think we were there about four days to do all the firing. So I did not leave the top of the mountain this, this, this <laughs> my one whole time one. there. So I'm not going back down That's there until it. I'm like on my way out. But, um, but I thought I was done because it was a corner too. So I was, thought I was going to go off the edge. And, okay. But then these three big dudes came down <laughs> and then pushed me back up. And that was a really fun time because of, if you have that book, everything that's in that book, um, that was, we just fired that over a period of, of three or four days. And, um, and Randy's a great cook, you know, so he cooked while we were there a lot. And um, it's it kind of like a workshop just for us, right, James? It was, yeah. So there are so many great shots that didn't make it into the book because nobody was taking photos at the time. And... Um, I think there's a shot on the cover. Remember that one night where it says, that we were doing a foil sagger and there's a lot of copper in the foil sagger. So as they were starting to, as the aluminum was starting to um, degrade a bit, then there was these beautiful like greens and reds and purples that were kind of swirling in the kiln. So this was at night though, it was like maybe nine o'clock at night and we were doing all of our shooting during the day. So it was at nighttime, so you could really see the inside of the kiln, all these colors just floating around and we were like, that would be a great shot <laughs> for the book. So then the next night, then we had, we tried to recreate that to, to get a night shot of that. Um, but it was a lot of fun and um, we got a whole lot of work done. And one of the things I was doing was the pit firing. So, so I dug this hole in Rob's yard to, to do the pit firing stuff. And when we left, um, he reminded me, you know, about a few months later, he goes, you never filled that hole back in. <laughs> So, um, and that kiln that we, because part of the um, book, you know, is, is, uh, was building that Raku kiln, like the fast fire kiln. And um, so I still have that, James. I have that kiln. I had to pick, no one else had a pickup. And my pickup was, as you know, empty. So I had stuff afterwards. So I put that kiln, so I still have it. I have it in storage. Um, fire blanket's still good. I haven't fired it up in a long time because you know, I live in the city now. But, um, but that was a really great time. And then about a year later, um, you know, Lark asked me if I wanted to, to write the, um, 
write the image transfer book, you know, on the different printmaking techniques. Um, now, after, you know, working with James and doing that first book and with the editor, I was like, okay, I've, I think I, I can do this. That's not a problem. So, so I agreed to do, so I agreed to do it. So then, you know, I got all the text done and everything, and then it was time to do the photography. And I, um, and I was like, so when am I coming down to, to North Carolina, to Asheville, to, to do the photo shoot? And they're like, oh no, that was just, that was a special thing. You need to, <laughs> so I had to find a photographer and do, do it all locally. But that was, so that they don't do, they didn't do that for people back then. So that whole, because of the way things needed to be fired and fired by specific people and through a certain time, and they needed all the lighting to be same and all that. Um, it just turned out to be a really great experience for, you know, for all of us down there for like three days to, it's almost like an alternative firing retreat. So, so yeah, I don't have that truck anymore, unfortunately, but that was scary. I didn't think that, I didn't think we were going to get up that mountain. So I'm going to print again like I did last time, but I am, so I have another block that I want to print on this clay slab. So the slab feels pretty good. Um, you want to get the clay to where it's not sticky or, or tacky to the touch. This is a touch tacky, but you know, it'll work. So just like the last one, I want to proof it first just to see how it looks. So I'm going to proof it first on um, newsprint. So same thing, I'm just rolling it up. And also with this underglaze, it's not modified at all either. It's just simply about the same. Good. Okay. It's just simply thickened up by letting it sit out yeah. for a couple of days. Now typically the first print is always a little bit heavy. And that's the other reason it's good to do it on paper first. Because you're trying to get your whole block rolled up pretty well, so it, it just tends to get rolled a little heavier. Once there's underglaze on it, um, it's easier for the other underglaze then to sit on top of that. All right, so I'm gonna kind of repeat the process. I'll go ahead and use the, the press for this. So if you weren't here earlier when I did this, um, this is called, a, this is, the company's Woodzilla. So this, it's not a clam press, but a, a clamshell press, you know, closes just like this. So that back hinge, there's always a little bit more pressure coming down. When I print with this, the pressure's in the center, so that's why I can use clay. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the paper on. Thank you. Put this blanket over. It's not really giving it a lot of pressure. And then we'll see how that looks. All right, so not, not bad. I don't know, can you see that? So that's pretty clean, actually. Um, wherever you have solid blacks, um, sometimes even under the best conditions with underglaze, there might be a little bit of like, you know, pocketing like that. So, but that's one of the advantages where, with using the press, I, I do have this nice even pressure. Otherwise, I can do it from the back with a bear. All right, so I'm going, so since I'm okay with this, I'm going to roll it up again, but this time I'm going to do it on clay. Now this body is a little bit lighter. It's a white body. It's a it's Amico body. I think it's called Amix. I haven't used that before. So it's going to be interesting to see how it looks. I have a little bit more contrast. And also, you know, when I'm rolling this up, I just want to roll it on the surface. I'm not, again, pressing down because I don't want to get any underglaze into my recessed areas. I'm trying to avoid that. So I'm just going to leave this on the plastic that I cut it on because it's just kind of easier to transport it. So when I was printing on paper, I was putting the block down and then putting paper mm -hmm. on top. But for printing on clay, you know, if I try to take the clay and put it on there, it's gonna, gonna stretch. So here, you know, I'm putting the clay down and I've used the rib to smooth the surface because whatever kind of texture that you have in a clay surface, that'll show up in, in your image. So you wanna make sure you smooth that out. Then I'm gonna take the block. 
and put it face down. Same thing with the corner and then lay it down. And I think that move to touch, that happens. If it shifts when you put it on, that's when you know maybe the clay was a little wet, but we'll still see what we got. So, so again, since it's not a clam, like a clamshell, this hinge would be here, then it would just come down. With this, um, it, this block floats. So as I come down, it settles to the thickness that I need. So when I'm pressing, there's these two bars that go under this arm. So when I'm pressing down, the um, pressure's in the middle. So that way, it, the slab won't get um, compressed on one of the edges. So here, I have to be careful not to press too hard. So we'll see. Sometimes, it, like with printmaking, you have to sometimes do it a few times to get it right. So I don't know. Yeah, I'll bring it up here. So, so with here, you know, I just grab the corner. It slid a little bit, so that's a little messy, but not terrible. I guess you can see it okay. <clears throat> so what I will do is I just do it again, and that's the thing. <laughs> and that's the thing about this is sometimes. Like I said, it doesn't work exactly the same way it works on. You think you get it on newsprint? Okay. Thank you. So let me try to get a little bit of a cleaner print. So with this, I won't do it right now. But if I don't like the print, I'm okay. Then I can just scrape it off, right, and just do it again. So, so nothing is sort of a nothing's an emergency. Get one. All right, so do this again. Now, this time I'm not going to press quite as hard. And those of you who are familiar with printmaking, you know that if I want 10 prints, I probably got to do 20 to, to get the 10 I actually need. I'll bring it up here so you can see my potential success or failure. That's a little cleaner. So this is more so what I'm looking a little bit more I know I'm moving around probably too much. So that's, that's a little better. The other one, it was just a little bit too heavy. Um, so I'd probably continue along with this. Now this could be a little, this is as good as I can get it with this condition. Um, if the slab were even drier, then it would absorb more of the underglaze. So that makes it a little bit, a little bit tighter as well. So. Okay, so that is that. <clears throat> now the other thing, see how we're doing on time. Ooh, 11.30. All right. So I use the side of my hand to check to see how it feels. Okay. Because <clears throat> I do want to pull that so you can see how the screen is, is made. Now this isn't a super messy process when you use a, what I'm gonna use as a scoop coater. It kind of helps keep your material um, contained. Hi, I have a question if I may please. I was wondering if you did not have a Woodzilla press, if you had any plan B 
best DIY alternative that you would recommend? That's actually not plan A, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, earlier, um, and I can do it again, I'll pull this, but normally plan A is um, you know, just using a bearing. So it's the exact same process, except I'll just hand print it. Perfect. So, so this is, um, this is kind of like plan B. So since I do a lot of printing, um, these are new. They only came out, I think, this year. And um, I wanted to see if they would work with clay, because yeah. the problem I was talking about before is lots of time presses um, like squeeze the clay on the edges, and it just doesn't. So since these kind of float, um, you're able to get a nice even pressure. But typically I always print by hand on paper as well. Wonderful, so. thank you. But I'll print again with this. So I know that there were some some screen printers that raised their hand earlier. Um, are there still some screen printers in here? Because typically pulling emulsion is like, that's the least fun thing to do, right? It's, it's, it's a one-shot thing in terms of um, getting it on. Now this is called a scoop coater. So with a scoop coater, um, instead of putting a bead on there and then pulling it across with a squeegee, I'm going to put it in this like little trough and then angle it up and then pull it up and that coats it and then take it off. So that's why I'm not taping up my edges because I'm just gonna pull this up the center. Um, so it's a little bit, of, it's a quicker way to do it. Um, some things come with a, with a lid, so if you wanted to, but you can't keep it stored in here permanently because it will dry out, but it's a good way to, you know, if you're gonna be using it for a day or two, then you can put it in there. All right, so pouring this in. And then with this, it's always good to um, make sure you wipe the, the threads on here. So that way when you put the lid back on, like a lot of things, if it dries, then it'll just kind of lock itself in there. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, when I'm putting this on, I do have it, I guess I'll, I want to do it away. Can you see the screen this way? Okay. Sponge. So I want to do it in a direction where you can see. So I'm gonna, again, put this against it, then I'm gonna tilt it, and I want all the um, screen filler to gather against the screen. And Those once it's gathered against the screen, sponge. then I'm going to pull it up, not too fast, not too slow, uh, pull it up evenly, and then when I get to the top, then I'm going to level it out, and then, I guess for a better word, uh, like cut it off, right? So once I do that, then I wanna have it, put it flat again, and then it'll dry. If you leave it upright, then the material will sag. I didn't go back over this, so it looks pretty good. Like when you're looking at it, you know, you want to be able to see the, the drawing fluid, the blue solution. Sometimes if the solution is a little thin, then it doesn't work as well blocking the screen filler. So we'll see what happens. All right, can you, is that a good angle? Okay. So I'm going to put this here. Can you see the inside of the trough too, or? Okay. Ooh. So I'm gonna slowly let it come forward. Now it's touching. Cut it off. There we go. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm done. So when, when you're done with this, then um, same thing, just wipe it off the edge, and then put the cap on. So that needs to air dry. And then once that's done air drying, um, you just rinse it out with water. It's all, and this, this is all, um, does anyone teach K-12? So this has the highly desired, you know, AP 
symbol on there. So, so if you're, because you can't use anything that doesn't have AP on it, K-12. Um, so this screen filler does have the AP on it. So there's a drawing fluid. So this is great. Like if I do something for like high schools or something, this is something I can take in. I mean, you can rinse it out in the sink. There isn't any special cleanup uh, or anything like that. So that's why it's so nice because like working with kids, then they can just draw whatever they want and then they could go through the process I did earlier in terms of tracing it into the screen. And then, then whoever the adult is in the room, you can assist <laughs> with the, uh, do a scoop coder because it makes it easier. So it's a really quick experience for them because by the time they get done drawing, then they put the drawing fluid on. Again, it's about 20 minutes and then you can scoop it. And then maybe about another 30 minutes later, um, once this is dry to the touch, you just rinse it out in water and then give the screens to the kids and then away they go. Now, once the screen is done, you could do the clay stuff that I'm showing you or you can just get fabric ink and do t-shirts, tote bags, you know, whatever. It's just a screen. You can use it for whatever you want. Um, but it's, it's really great if you are, um, if you are K-12 or, you know, adults, I mean, I, I use it too. Um, but it's nice and versatile. You don't need a special studio. You don't need special equipment. Uh, Paul, did you have background in screen printing and just printmaking before doing it on clay or is this a new venture when you started it? I did. I've, I've always done it because my professor, Victor Spinsky, um, so as an undergrad, you know, Victor Spinsky made ceramic decals. And so the undergrad student, we just had a room where he did four color separation. So it was just something that I thought was normal, actually. I thought everybody in uh, clay knew how to screen print. So I didn't realize it was unusual <laughs> until I was more like a junior and, and like that. So, um, yeah, and, and also for me, it's something that, like the screening and the relief kind of suits my style of drawing a little bit better as well. Because um, no matter how you draw, when you're doing it, when you're recreating it as a screen, what that does is kind of recreates that image too. Because your brush stroke is going to be a different width than your pencil stroke. So I like how it transforms it. Um, what size mesh for the screen are you using and can you use the same screen when you're printing with underglaze versus using like regular printing ink for like tote bags or for on paper and stuff? Yeah, so for printing with clay, you want to have it between, it can be as low as 60 and it can be as tight as 325. Like screen mesh is like, um, like DPI, right? The, the lower the DPI, the, the bigger like the, the pixels are and so, so just like our regular mesh. So about a 200 is normally what I use. Just the t-shirt kind, like whatever you buy normally is normally like 180, 220. So all of that works fine. Once it gets tighter than 320, then you have to thicken up your underglazes more, add a transparent base, and you have to use a squeegee because it's, such, it's so tight um, that you have to force it, you know, force it through to get that. Um, now the only re the reason that you would have a screen that is a higher mesh is if you're going to have a more detailed image and you're probably using Diazo um, emulsion for that. A lot of the things I do aren't super detailed because what I want to do then is uh, customize them more afterwards. So I'm always just around the, the 180, 220, 220 mesh. And as far as using it, um, yeah, then I use the same screens to print um, acrylic ink too. Yeah, so the nice thing about the screens is that you can use it, um, you know, for anything. It's not, it isn't anything that's special in the sense that you have to just use it for underglaze. And I find that the underglaze doesn't, um, it doesn't really wear your screen out too much either. You would think it would, but it's not like, like with other screen, like with regular screen printing, you might end up making um, like 80 prints with that. So that eventually does wear your screen out. But for clay purposes, you know, I don't make, it's not that high of a volume. So the image doesn't really wear out. And then with this uh, drawing fluid and screen filler, that holds up in the screen a long, long time. Okay, what I was gonna do is attempt to do a multicolor one. So to do something with multiple colors, so this is already a lino cut that I made. 
<laughs> so, so sometimes they call it a, a jigsaw um, line of cut. So I just, you know, have three pots on a table. So I carved it and then I just cut them out individually. So that way I can ink them up individually and print them. So I'm going to go ahead and do the floor black. And I'll do this on paper so it's, it's easier to see. And I know we're, I think, starting to butt up against it, right? Um, does it require um, a chemical to clean the screen if you want to reuse the screen? Um, well, it is a degreaser. There's a, I don't have it up here, um, but there's a, they, it's called Speed Clean. <laughs> um, so again, this is a you know, speedball product, and they also, it's called Speed Clean, and it's just a clear solution. And then you um, just pour it onto the surface. I don't know where that question came Oh, over here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so you just pour it onto the surface, and then it breaks it down. And then you just rinse it out underwater, and, and it, it goes away. Not dangerous for K through 12? No, it also has the, the AP the label AP. on it, too. Cool. Yeah, and, that, and that's the thing. Um, Thank you. That's the important thing. I know with K-12, it has to have AP on there to work. So now, if you leave it in there for six or seven months, it is harder to get it out. So, but if you're getting it out within a couple of months, it breaks down pretty easy. You don't need like a pressure washer or anything like that to blow it out. It's just, let that, and it's not a chemical. It's just a, it's just a degreaser. I used to use Mr. Clean. That does the same thing too. Um, but when you pour it on, just let it, it basically dissolves dissolve that emotion away. Okay, so with these, I'm gonna to have to roll them a little quicker, see if I have any paper. There we go. So I will do this a little quicker, just so you can see the possibility of it. I always like to do dark colors because they show up better, but here I am using a light color. Now these haven't been printed yet, so it's a test print, but still might come out okay. Now this, what I'm showing you here, this is just straight relief block printing. So you can do the same thing with just colored inks as well. And I think, oh good, I have one more slab. So if this looks okay, you know, fingers crossed, then I'll, I have a slab of clay back there, I'll do it on clay as well. So I'm just literally just keying them together where they're supposed to be. We have 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And put the paper down. And then we'll see what we got. Ah, okay. I should just stop. <laughs> I want to roll. All right, so, but, you know, I won't. So I will... Yeah, that's, I'm gonna have to keep that. Now, this is a double demo. This is called a paper transfer. <laughs> so anytime you do any underglaze on newsprint, I can just put this face down and you know, spritz it, rub it, and that's a paper transfer. Here you go. Two for the price of one demo there. All right, so I will do the same exact thing on this piece of clay. Hey Paula, I have a question. So when you transfer it from a paper to clay, do you let the underglaze dry on the clay? Or like on the paper, sorry, before transferring it? Or do you do it wet? You can actually do it both ways. Okay. Um, if you let it dry first, then you need to um, wet the paper just a little bit more and burnish a little bit more for it to release. Um, now if you do it that way, you will get a cleaner print. Okay. Um, if you, but you know, this is, you know, pretty dry now. So what I would do is same thing. It's still the same process, 
but when I'm spritzing the back, I won't need to maybe burnish quite as much because it's releasing from the paper faster. Okay. So, and but yeah, if you let it dry, if you, want to, if you do want a clean print then, just let it dry and then maybe just 10 minutes, it, it, it goes pretty fast. Have you ever drawn on the paper to then transfer it to the clay? Sure, yep, you can do that too. You can just use your brushes and, yeah, you can just treat this just like a piece of paper, whether you print on it or screen on it or brush on it. Now this is basically, it's a paper transfer, but it's sort of like mono printing. So if you put, like if I put a line here, then if my line goes on top, when I pull it off, it's gonna be like that. So you're going from foreground to background if you are layering your colors if you're painting or drawing. But yeah, you can absolutely do that. <clears throat> then also, depending on what you're putting it on, you, if it needs to fit in a very specific area, you can trim it out to fit in that area mm -hmm. as well. So it's a nice versatile way uh, to work uh, paper transfers. It's not gonna be as much color as if you were able to directly print on it, because um, you're transferring color from a, a plate to a substrate, and then from that substrate to there, so there's a little bit of loss <clears throat> of color. So. But it, really, it works really well if you're like collaging on a surface and you want to layer, layer things. So yeah, just wait for whatever you did. There's some air bubbles in here. It's fine. Um, so whatever you did, you just need to wait for, <clears throat> excuse me, for it to dry before you print on top of it. Okay. Um, and so when you're drawing, do you also make sure that the slip is thinner? Yeah, same consistency. Because if it's really thick, then it just cr it gets, it cracks. The thing about transferring, like, like more isn't better when it comes to, to that. All right, so I'm going to go James? ahead and get color on here yes. again. Um, um, could you speak a little bit about the bottom of your pot? I see that you've trimmed out that mm -hmm. and made a foot. I mm -hmm. su suppose that's about a leather hard when you did that. And yes. then is the bottom going all the way through the interior wall plus the inside of the vessel? Well, I, I prepared this yesterday, so I, I put a coil on the bottom of it, and I carved it out this morning, and then I poked a hole, poked three holes through each foot, so that that allows uh, the air to escape on the inside of the, the wall, so the holes go all the way through to the inside between the two walls and um, but the there's one continuous bottom then right there's one continuous bottom yes. but air vents for the interior yes okay thank you so I'm doing the opposite here where I have my clay slab down and then I'm putting my pieces um, face down Now here's where I have to be careful not to again press too hard because I'm only going to do one so this will work or not work but you'll see the process. All right, turn it around for your inspection. All right, so. <laughs> okay, one out of three is not bad. Oops, two out of three. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> three out of three. Okay. Here you go. <laughs> now, in it, I pressed a little harder than I wanted to. I don't know if this picks up on the camera, but see, it's a light embossing there. So, because you can emboss it as well. Okay. You know where that rib is? The, the, I'm all right with that. Leave it over somewhere. Oh, okay, thank you. Paul, I had a question about, you know, the advantages of working with like a bisque piece of clay versus unfired clay and like when you would, do you do both and um, like, you know, what the advantages and disadvantages of both? Do I have a, I rarely I work have on bisque. On that one? Um, not for any particular reason. Um, well, I guess one reason. Um, once it's bisque, if it's not perfectly flat, then it's a bit harder to, to get a clean image. Um, and it's harder to, to wipe off a mistake. 
So if I'm just printing on, on greenware, you know, on leather hard, if like this one, this I can wipe off and I can print again. So it's a little bit easier to, to reuse. Um, and for, if I am printing on bisque, uh, then I would probably be printing glaze, um, just printing glaze on there instead. Uh, but there, it's, it's just a little bit trickier. Also, um, if I print on bisque, that's when I would do a more traditional way of, like, say, silk screening, where you know, I would have it on and I'd have my hinges so that it's just floating a touch over the surface. So when you're pulling the squeegee, the only contact is where your blade is going. So that way you get a better print. So, so you just have to print it a little bit differently because of the surface. Um, but I don't have a preference. I just... I like to get as much as I can on greenware, so when I fire it, then I can do more color afterwards. I just, I just like things coming out of the kiln with, with something on it already. But there are a lot of people who um, go ahead and do the tiles first or their, whatever their pieces are, bisque them, and then they come in and print afterwards. You just, you just want to have more of a low bisque, like maybe around 06-ish. Because if it's too high of a bisque, if it's like 04, I mean, even 08 is better, you need the bisque to be porous. Because if it isn't porous anymore, then, it's, then the material won't uh, wick into the surface. So that would be the one thing. So depending on your clay body, do, a, do more of a soft bisque, so that way it's more receptive uh, to the, you know, pulling in the underglazes. If I could uh, ask James uh, for clarification on thickness and mm -hmm. moisture control, and you may have addressed this and I came like an hour late, but um, do you have a suggestion for a wall thickness when you are working in these larger coiled forms? Um, what is that, about? Half inch? Not quite a half inch, three, three fourths? Maybe three eighths, about well, three eighths. Yeah. And do you find structurally, if you were to go thinner, is that just up to the confidence of the potter, or like structurally, would there be issues going thinner than that? Um, I think it's confidence of the potter. Um, sure. It's not not so much structurally. And if I, I'm just going to pick your brain, I'm so sorry. Um, with moisture control, uh, clearly you've, you're, you know, working with something leather hard underneath and then you're reanimating to, you know, a throwing consistency up top. Uh, do you find delicate, you know, work between those seams or those different shrink rates uh, mm. occur? Um, well, in my studio, I, I try to uh, dry them very slowly and I try to keep them uh, at the same consistency as much as possible, so I use a lot of um, drying control by keeping them covered with plastic and uh, not let them dry out too unevenly. And when I move them, I only move them when they're le leather hard. I never move them when they're dry because they're, they're more uh, fragile when they're dry and they're stronger when they're leather hard. I even I put them in the kiln when they're leather hard and let them dry inside the kiln when they're leather hard. Um, I've lost pieces uh, trying to put them in the kiln when they're dry. They just kind of crumble in my hand, you know. So I learned that through trial and error. And uh, I, don't, I don't like, I, they, they're heavy period, because they're double wall and everything. I don't like them to be real heavy, but because I, I don't like having an, an assistant, I like to be able to move them myself. But occasionally I do have to get somebody to come over and help me. I used to get my son to do it, but now he lives in Oakland, California, so that doesn't, doesn't work anymore. Sure. Yeah. And if I could have one last follow-up question. Uh -huh. um, so I work in a lot of combined form application, and I'm very curious to explore the coiled form technique, and I guess what are your thoughts between the two techniques to create larger work? Uh, like, coil, coil or what? Like throwing half of a vase and then the other top half of a vase and then sticking like, oh, I sections see. Yeah. together. Um, well, I've done both, and... For me, I, I don't know if you're noticing, but I, I like to kind of 
do different forms. I, uh, I want it to go in and out a little bit, and I have more control with the coil if I do it that way. Sure. Um, because I can control the, the shape a little bit better if I use the coil. That's why I do the, use the coil technique. Um, and I like working this way. I like working slow and intentional. I'm in no hurry. I enjoy my studio. I listen to music. I have a TV. I watch Ju Judge Judy. <laughs> and inside edition, you know. Those are my vices, so. <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much. Uh-huh. I'm over here running around one side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will go ahead, since I did it a little bit, I will go ahead and um, emboss you know, emboss one on purpose, because it does look really nice. Now, the thing about embossing clay is it has a very different look than if you were to carve it, because if you were to carve the surface, then the surface is flat, and then all the recessed areas, you know, make up whatever the, the form is going to be. So when you're doing clay, embossing into clay, oh, use this one. Okay. What's going to happen is that the tool that I used when I was carving this, um, like the, the different sweeps and the different V-shape, now those are going to be high areas. So they're going to be either um, you know, the sweeps or the corners. So when you're embossing it, um, it, it looks... I just love the way the embossed pieces look because you see the shape of the tool that you carved. And then the other areas also that get recessed also have a different look. So it does look very much, it looks very different from carving when you emboss. So I will go ahead and do that. So this is, feels pretty soft. So I put that on top. I haven't been doing as good today about protecting the surface, but it's, it's good. So this one sometimes you just have to do it a couple times. Again, depending on how soft the clay is, will dictate how hard you might have to press. And you can do this, of course, with the um, with the Baron uh, as well. So everything I'm doing with this, you would just you know press from this end. All right, so there we go. So see how, um, trying to, so can you, like, especially look up top where it's, so you can see how it's just not an up and down kind of texture, it's, it takes on the contours of it. So, so, the other, so the thing I like about that is then, like I'm no good at doing um, like Mishma, like, like let this dry, then put an underglaze on it and scrape it off the top. I just always wipe away you know, the image too. So what I do then, I bisque fire these. Then once they're bisque, then I can go back in and put glaze wherever I want and then refire so that way it looks more like inlaid glaze um, so I can just fill in those recessed areas you know, with different colors. Or I can um, you know, bisque fire it and then put a coat of black underglaze on there and then just wipe it off the high spots so the black underglaze is in the recessed areas. And then I'll take um, a glaze and I'll roll it out with a roller so that when I roll the glaze over top, it's just getting on the high areas and not getting down into the recessed areas. And then I can fire that. Or I can go ahead and put that underglaze in there, wipe it off the high spots. And then I can just put like a breaking glaze on there as well. Or sometimes you just put a breaking glaze in there. So where it pools, it's a different color. And where it's, so depending on what you do, then you can just, just treat it like any other slab, right? You just had a different way to put an image or a texture or a design on it, um, on it or in it. Um, and you can, you know, again, it is just, just a slab, so you can, you know, hand build with it and, and do different kinds of things. So we don't have like water, water 
up here. So, I mean, we're really, I think I saw Chanda somewhere. I know we're gonna get rushed off. So, so between now and tomorrow, because I've, I've seen everyone, I expect you back. <laughs> um, I'm gonna rinse this out so that way this is open so I can print with this tomorrow. And tomorrow what I'm gonna do is show you then how to, I'm gonna print this on adhesive vinyl so I can cut out um, what are called flats. So I can make this into a multi, like I can do a background color or, so I'm gonna show how to do that. If you have a screen, how can you make screens where you're just basically printing flats underneath to have, have multiple colors? Um, I have that larger press over there as well. I, I didn't think I'd get to it today, but I have some bigger blocks as well. So tomorrow I wanted to show how I print a larger block. And I also have um, a triptych that I'm gonna try to print tomorrow as well. And I have a much larger screen that I'm gonna use a squeegee. So, it's, so today I wanted to kind of go over some of these. How do you make the tools and how do you get images in certain substrates? And then tomorrow um, I have things ready to go where I can print a little bit larger and show some other techniques based off of what, what we went over um, today. I'll try to flip this. I don't know if, <laughs> if, it's, if this is dry enough. Yeah, this is super fast trying to flip this. See how it's a little saggy on here? Because it needs like another hour, but we don't have that. So I'm gonna take my other plaster bat and put it on the back, because that'll help wick it. I'm gonna to try to flip this to see if we can see. I'm gonna use this so I have something to hold. Ah, here we go. So this, I could just wipe off with a sponge and then it's ready to, to print again. Any, you're always gonna have a little bit of residual color still in there, so that, that's not a problem. So again, just with a sponge, wipe that off. If for some reason it's a hard time getting it out, then just get um, just sandpaper, just the wet, wet sandpaper, like a 400 or a 600 grit wet sandpaper, and they can just lightly sand the surface, and that'll remove any like hard to get out stains. Paul, um, was that, was that um, the black to the clay, is that raised at all or is that just flat like on the, on the plaster? Okay, um, this is perfectly flat Okay. Um, because when the image is on there, when the casting slip is poured on top, what it does is it wicks the underglaze into the surface of your um, clay slab. So that's, so if this had a, that's why this should be perfectly flat because then your surface is going to be perfectly flat. So yeah, that's a good question. Okay, sweet. Thank you. Um, and that's the beauty of it as well. And that's why you don't need a lot of material. It's actually, it's actually your, your surface when you pull that off. Now, once it gets a little drier, then I would, you know, I could just trim that up and it's like, I like, I like, I have these little guys cause I like, I do like making some small things sometimes, you know, I can go through ideas um, a little bit quicker. Yeah, with the other ones, um, like the question, Inferred, um, it's sitting more on top. You know, when you're printing on the surface, um, it's sitting more on top. Not a lot because going through a screen, like the width of the, like the depth of the screen is very thin. So that's as thick as the layer of underglaze is. <laughs> I know we have to stop, right? Thanks for so just so everybody coming. knows, these fine gentlemen will be back tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock. Um, at 1 o'clock today, we have two fantastic female artists taking the stage, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing them as well. So either grab something to eat and come back, or um, plan to be back tomorrow at 1 to catch the end of them. But our artists this afternoon will be here, and then they'll be back in the morning at 9. So it's a flip-flop. Thank you, guys.